Hey, I'm Sasan Kisravi with Proteus Debate Academy. We're a channel that tries to bring free, high-quality content to increase equity in debate. Um, I got a round request, I think yesterday, last night maybe, and I happen to have this morning pretty free. We did our um, biannual, like once per semester, semesterly, I think that's a word, uh, showcase. That was really stressful because I was trying to get a video ready for it and you're doing like online stuff. But now that I have off, not that I have that off my plate and um, I don't have to judge at a tournament today because the only tournament we're entered in only allows one coach in prep. It's a, like a small round robin. Paul's off doing that. I got some time. Why not? Let's do a round. This round appealed to me for two reasons. One, because it's a, apparently, according to the person who made the request, it's a pretty theory-heavy round, which I haven't really seen much in public forum. Um, and I'd be curious to see how teams are executing theory debate in that format. Uh, the second reason is that it's paraphrasing theory. Paraphrasing is something that I've talked about on this channel. Um, I don't think it makes for good evidentiary debate, and that seems to be where the national circuit is like trying to take public forum. Um, so it'll be interesting. I don't necessarily know that theory is the appropriate or best way to advocate for paraphrasing um so at the end of the day if the rules explicitly say you're allowed to do it maybe theory isn't the most appropriate way to try to create that change um there's a lot of meetings that these organizations that make these rules have that most students aren't aware of and certainly don't participate in um part of that is because of distance right they have these meetings at national tournaments or like major gatherings where most average teams aren't attending, though they're technically voting members on whatever decision gets made. I know that's the case with, like, in college with the NFA and uh, Faro Pi, these organizations that each year have business meetings, but really only the teams that went get to make the decisions on the behalf of, well, the changes affect how every event is had for the whole year at every tournament. So um, I recommend that, especially since travel isn't really a restrictive factor this year, um, you should think about what changes you want to see in your debate event and be an advocate for it. These people have these meetings with your best intentions in mind, at least allegedly. And um, with that said, let's see how this round goes. Maybe... Um, I'll be all about this uh, use of theory. I'm certainly not going to buy arguments that like paraphrasing is better for debate. At least I don't think so. Um, this is also a very recent video. Um, from what I can tell, it was uploaded like two days ago, which means that I think for the first time that we've done one of these analysis videos, the I mean, I don't really know. Um, that I'm doing an analysis video on two teams that are actively still competing. So, I don't know, that's a little weird for me because I don't want to say anything discouraging to those teams. And for the record, like if I say anything that contradicts what your coaches have told you, go with your coaches because um, coachability is the most important trait a debater can have. We have a video on that. Watch it. Um, but also, I don't really know what I'm talking about, right? I don't know your circuit. I don't know your skills. I don't know who you're debating against. And even if I did know better, I'm not your coach. And I might suggest something, but I'm not there to help people execute and, like, practice. So uh, I know that's really frustrating for me as a coach when my students i love when my students get advice from other people i just don't like it when they come back to me and like but so and so said that you're wrong and we need to do it this way because what am i supposed to do with that information right then go get coached by so and so i don't know what that well, i don't know what they're talking about um anyway i feel like that's enough disclaimers um we have 
a college tournament coming up that should be a really big tournament for certainly our hosting standards, but also, I think, for just Northern California standards. So we're excited for that. And our videos aren't by any means just for competitors, right? Um, and it's not just for high school competitors. A major part of our audience, or at least the audience we want to reach are people who are coaching programs and are looking for resources on how to do certain things. So with that in mind, as we prepare for that tournament and as we host that tournament, I plan to make a bunch of videos about like how I write debate topics, how I write impromptu topics and stuff that, uh, I don't know, I feel like people don't do because people don't want to put themselves out there like that, right? Like, I don't by any means assume that I know better than other people, but I think by just getting my method and my way of doing it out there, that'll at least give some concept to other people or start a discussion. I can get corrected. I can learn something, right? Um, I don't think I'm bad at it. I think I'm pretty good at it. But my point is that most people don't put themselves out there. And I think it's important also for competitors to know how these topics are written so that you can better prepare and know what sort of things to expect. Anyway, that's enough disclaimer and uh, channel talk. Let's get into the video. I have some uh, cold tea that's pretty gross, but whatevs. Is this going to block out any, uh, oh, no, cool. Everyone's face is going to be nice in the center frame. All right. Um, I know this is by reading Bethesda versus Leland. I don't know which team is which side. So if they don't say their names, I guess, cool. It says under Bethesda. All right. Uh, I don't know who's going to win. I'm glad the RFD is there because, um, and I can see if any of the judges agreed with my analysis. Ready. Eli and I negate. Contention one is economic tyranny. The $34 trillion Medicare for All Act mandates tax financing. Booth 20 of Healthline confirms the funding for all Medicare for All plans comes down to taxes. Progressive forms of taxation and wealth taxes would never fly. As rich campaign donors systematically block such proposals. Right. And even okay. if they pass, the wealthy pay tax lawyers. Medicare for All, negative. This must have been pretty late in the game taxes i guess that's a pretty good argument i mean the only issue with it is that it's done to death right like this was done to death two years ago in the media and there's debate after debate with bernie sanders explaining the whole tax situation now he didn't win the nomination so his argument isn't even necessarily that it will collapse the economy at least it's not so far it's saying that it won't fly but um I don't know. It, I think polls have indicated otherwise, but let's let's see the evidence. Millions to evade them. Thus, the burden would overwhelmingly fall on the middle class. Stark 17 of Forbes contextualizes. The cost of Medicare for all would devastate the overall economy. The proposal calls for six new taxes, and everyone pays 6.2% more in payroll tax and 2.2% more in income tax. As a result, Fish Pond 19 of Heritage finds 73.5% of Americans will have less money in their pockets under Medicare for All. The cost of new taxes left pay will be far more than they saved on health care. This has two devastating effects. First is employment. Finance 16 of Real Clear Policy finds tax rates affect people's decisions to work. The higher a person's marginal tax rate, the bigger the disincentive to work more. Thus, M4A would reduce employment by 11.6 million people. This is on net accounting for increases in health care workers. On top of that, taxes under Medicare for All would reduce... Um... That analysis, I wasn't sure I picked up correctly. So the evidence, as paraphrased, seemed to be saying that tax brackets disincentivize working more. I'm not clear what the evidence that then connects that with unemployment is saying, right? Like, I get like, oh, it's not worth it for me to pick up 20 extra hours a week because that would put me in the next tax bracket and it's a diminishing returns and I'm not going to bother. I don't understand the argument that says I'd rather starve to death because if I make $50,000 a year, the government's going to take X amount. Um, and 
I'd like to hear the warrants explaining how that works, and maybe that's what the theory is going to be about, but um, let's get into it. Incomes and therefore consumer spending, which is a critical component of growth. Thus, the CRFB 20 quantifies tax financing Medicare for All would reduce GDP by 7.3% in 2030. Abroad, due to lower import volumes and trade, Aurora 4 of the IMF writes, a 1% increase in U.S. growth is correlated with an average 1% increase in growth in other countries, with Bajoria 08 of the CFR terminalizing a 1% decline in developing country growth, perhaps an additional 20 million people into poverty. Contention 2 is medical imperial. Um, those arguments aren't bad. The issue that bothers me, and, I, and it's just kind of how I am, is that they are... They're not talking in the same direction, right? Like, there's a logical fallacy called denying the antecedent. And in general, coming up after, as a response to your opponent, just saying, that's a logical fallacy isn't enough, right? But um, it's still important to understand argument structure. So denying the antecedent says that... Uh, if A equals B, so the, the the fallacy is saying A equals B, not A, therefore not B. Um, and it's something that I've talked about before on the channel, but we have so many videos, I, I couldn't even tell you which video I mentioned it in. And that doesn't really sound like a logical fallacy um, when you first hear it, and that's why it's a super common one. So for example, um, if Dexter, the serial killer, um, forgets to clean up the crime scene, he will get caught. Dexter didn't forget to clean up the crime scene, therefore he won't get caught. Doesn't really seem like a massive problem with this argument, except not forget remembering the crime scene is not the only condition relative to getting caught or not, right? So, like, there could be witnesses, or you could confess, or... There could be, I don't know, any number of other things, right? So that's important because you need to know what direction your warrant is talking in. So, for example, a lot of times people will have arguments about the environment. And they'll say, uh, such and such a thing contributes negative, like greenhouse gases contribute negatively to the environment. Uh, we reduce greenhouse gases, therefore we solve climate change, which, like, your evidence doesn't say reducing it by this amount fixes climate change. It says increasing it by X amount would make it worse. Um, and while that is maybe nitpicky, it's just get better evidence, right? If your argument is true, just get evidence that directly says doing your thing leads to the thing that you're saying it will. Otherwise, I'm taking the word of I can't tell if his name is Roy. I'm going to say Roy. And I'm sure, I don't know if Chevy Chase is the name of um, his school or his favorite actor. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, otherwise I'm taking the, the word of this debater who I'm sure is bright and I'm sure knows a lot more about the world and especially about economics than I do, but it defeats the purpose of having like warrants and sources because I'm just relying on your analysis, which isn't immune to your opponents just saying that doesn't sound right. Um, anyway. Thomas 19 of MI writes, under Medicare for All, there will be no payment made by patients when they receive treatment. Consumers make more frequent visits to doctors, specialists, and emergency rooms. This is problematic. As Thomas furthers, doctors are already struggling to keep up with demand. 80% of physicians can be at capacity or overextended. With doctors already overburdened, an unbearable increase in demand for healthcare will leave us with two choices. Either watch quietly as the entire system collapses, or find a way to get significantly more doctors. Indeed, Bivens 20, the EPI, quantifies. Expanded access to healthcare under Medicare for All would translate into demand for 2.3 million more full-time workers providing healthcare. In more relatable terms, this would mean tripling the number of doctors and care workers, which would be devastating, as Telenco 10 of foreign policy claims there is nowhere for health professionals to come but from overseas, as the domestic education system simply won't produce enough. 
Indeed, Chilenko finds to be increased demand for doctors, Congress has historically increased the number of U.S. residency positions, which were filled by doubling the country's annual importation of foreign-trained doctors from the developing world. These effects are long-term, as old 16 of the WEF writes, when doctors in the developing world complete their residency programs in the U.S. and the U.K., they rarely return home. In fact, they are often given permanent visa status and a license to practice medicine. Even worse, Chulenko explains, medical brain drain affects entire education systems. Only the brightest pass your certification exams, meaning those who emigrate are often top university professors. Pulling hundreds of thousands of professors and doctors from poor nations is devastating, as doctors there are vastly more important than those here. The Law 20 of the World Economic Forum explains what- Okay, this is, um, basically every argument in this chain is a decent and kind of cookie cutter argument. Um, so like- Brain drain was a common argument, I would imagine, in the H-1B topic. Um, but they're kind of, like, put too much back to back, where you're not going to have one card that tells the horse, whole story, which is always dangerous, right? Um, so, for example, I don't think they have one card that says passing Medicare for all will cause the healthcare system of Uganda to collapse. Um, and if it were true, right, if, if Roy was able to figure that out, you think that information would have made it to Bernie Sanders' desk by now, right? So that's always like a little iffy when you're trying to connect too many of those back to back to back, because if it's really such an easy thing that a high schooler with a month of research could figure it out, then why would none of the experts that are on, like, these policy panels for Medicare for All have figured it out? Or why don't they care? With that said, let's examine the actual arguments that are going on. The first argument is that uh, Medicare for All is going to increase the visits to doctors. Um... Which is probably true, but the argument after that is that this is going to, like, overwhelm or collapse the system. I don't know why it does that, right? Like, in a, in a by appointment, like, people with Medicare for All will go to the doctor more because they won't wait for emergencies in order to go to the doctor. I don't think there's a significant amount. Maybe there are people who are avoiding going to urgent care and, um the emergency room because they don't have insurance. But most of the people who are going to go to the doctor for Medicare for All are going on a by appointment situation, right? Um, and I don't understand how, like, it's not like they're all in the hospital at the same time. You just have to wait a long time, which is an argument that can be made, right? Like, People talk about the UK and Canada's healthcare system and how long you have to wait for care because how many people are going to the doctor and all that. But I don't know how it collapses anything. And like, what does it actually look like for these doctors to be too busy? Are they like treating three patients at the same time or are there just a lot of people in the waiting room? And what exactly is the problem with that? The other issue is that there's probably some good ground for turns here because the cost and sort of issues in medicine compound the later you try to seek care for something. So in other words, if you have pre-diabetes, it's ultimately less work and less cost and less of a burden on the healthcare system to treat that as early as possible um, because you came in, you got a screening and so on, than to try to treat it when you have Full, like fully developed diabetes or like failing kidneys, right? It's, it's better to treat um, cancer when it's stage one or stage two versus when it's stage four because it's just way more resource intensive. And the argument would be that, be yeah, there's a lot more people seeking care, but they're seeking, um, man, I'm so tired, I can't remember the term for uh, preemptive? That's not it. I probably even just said it earlier. I'm exhausted. Um, yeah, preemptive, why not? Um, they're getting preemptive care, right? So 
they're not going because they feel bad. And that way you get screenings, you get things taken care of, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, that frees up a lot of work that these doctors would inevitably have to do. Because if you're sick, if you're not sick and you go for a checkup, you're not that much of a burden, right? They run three tests, cookie cutter, go home. Uh, if you are sick, you're going to end up in the hospital eventually anyway. Um, so it's not like these doctors are avoiding treating this patient. They're just putting it off and treating them when the ailment is way harder to deal with. Okay. All of that was a really long explanation for an argument that probably isn't going to be relative to the rest of your year or really the rest of this debate. But what can I say? This is, um, this is what I do. That's why there's chapters in the, in the, in the bottom. Okay. So from there, we're going to, all right, this is going to increase the demand for doctors and the domestic um, sector can't fill that. All right, yeah, probably. And then we're going into brain drain, which is like, all right, we might, and then says that a significant number of that is going to come from countries that can't really spare the doctors. I've looked at the brain drain evidence, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty good, but just most of the doctors don't come from like, I'm a, the only doctor for 100 miles in a village in Ethiopia and that is being ravaged by Ebola, and now I'm going to go to the U.S. In addition to that, like, why should these people be trapped in these countries if they don't want to be? If they want to leave and have a life somewhere else... Um, especially when there's probably arguments that says like the World Health Organization and other international like Doctors Without Borders and stuff like that solves back <clears throat> for at least attempts to solve back for a lack of doctors. Um, but with that said, if you can get to the medical brain drain and the small rural communities and whatever, the impacts on it are great um, because as we all know from the fact that this debate is not happening in person, extreme poverty anywhere in the world becomes a massive issue for everyone everywhere in the world we don't we live in too interconnected a world for us to be uh immune to the filth that some people have to live in and they're forced to live in because then they get sick and they get everybody else sick we we can't shield ourselves from the uh horrible conditions that other people have to live in so probably incumbent on us to make sure that everyone everywhere in the world has um a decent quality of life um if you weren't ethical or moral to want that in the first place and you need to have personal incentive okay so anyway with that having been said i think it's just like a lot of steps so and the other one is like a oh, taxes argument i'm not sure what the impact on that is unemployment the other thing is that these arguments are a little samey because he, the terminalization of the unemployment was like third world economies and this is now about third world doctors, which is basically grouping your impacts. So if they answer third world arguments or that they're fine, status quo solves or whatever, or that the plan will turn, increase, whatever, because it makes medicine tree cheaper or the research better. I don't know. Whatever argument it is, it's going to answer both of your arguments equally to the degree that they can identify the commonality and then make that analysis. What you want is to diversify your, in the words of uh, the Wu-Tang Clan, diversify your bonds. Um, okay. Let's take a look at the rest of this argument. One doctor's death in Africa is a loss to more than 10,000 people. As a result, Chulenko quantifies child mortality triples as communities go from five health workers per thousand to one, killing millions annually. These effects get exponentially worse the more doctors leave at once. In Nika 15, the IMG explains, when significant numbers of doctors migrate, their countries will be return on investment on physicians. With fragile health systems, the continuing loss of intellectual capital can bring the entire system to collapse with devastating consequences. Oppenheim 17 of Brookings contextualizes, the first line of defense against pandemics is surveillance, monitoring populations to spot outbreaks and contain them quickly. Furthering, disease surveillance is weakest in impoverished countries short on infrastructure and epidemiologists. These weaknesses cause isolated outbreaks to go undetected longer and spread, thus robbing the developing world. Like you don't have a card that says 
the brain drain is of epidemiologists. Like, and this is the problem with using generic links, right? And like these, like, sure, there's an increase in demand for doctors, but why is there an increase in demand for epidemiologists? We already have epidemiologists here and people trying to go for like just checkups don't need epidemiologists. So uh, that's demonstrating the problem that I was talking about. Of thousands of doctors makes lethal with small scale infection diseases like Ebola and Zika more likely to become full blown pandemics. The WHO 1996 contextualizes at least 30 new diseases emerged in the last 20 years and now threaten the health of millions. With dramatically fewer doctors in the developing world, any one of those diseases could have gone and could still go global. Just one pandemic is catastrophic, as Hastings 16 the NCBI quantifies. A pandemic today as bad as the flu of 1918 could equal or could kill between 74 and 370 million people. Thus, we're proud of the gate. Um, I think. The other issue with this case is that it's not really speaking to the status quo at all. I don't have any reason to believe that the status quo is solving for either the health problems in the United States or that the status quo is really solving for like pandemics and doctor shortages and other stuff abroad, which probably makes has a potential has the potential to make a lot of these impacts non unique um, or at least make the AF try or die. Right. Um, so there's a lot of str strategy in speaking to the status quo, like what disease is currently being stopped from spreading. Um, so for example, when I prepped a um, brain drain argument, we were specific to like which country, what disease, Ebola, how many cases do they have? Like a hundred, but they've contained it and blah, blah, blah. But um, so yeah, being more specific to especially status quo arguments is going to be really strong. Um, but let's hear this argument. We affirm the United States federal government should act the Medicare for All Act of 2019. Our sole contention is protecting American health care. The American health care system... Okay, so I guess the negative runs disclosure in the rebuttal? Um... Public forum is really weird because the second speaking team can be the AF and then the rebuttal response that, I don't know, but let's, let's see. Ruins. Line R20 writes that 23% of Americans have steered clear of health insurance due to rising costs and continues that the uninsured population is expected to increase by 6.5 million people by 2028. Moreover, even people that get insurance still suffer as Collins 19 reports an estimated 44 million people were underinsured in 2019 because of additional costs. Unfortunately, Bank 12 finds that the rising U.S. healthcare costs will surpass the average American's incomes by 2033. For all these reasons, SOAR 19 finds that the U.S. has 26% more healthcare amenable debts than every other comparable country. Medicare for All helps save American healthcare on two fronts. The first is revitalizing hospitals. So um, the best argument there by far is exactly what I was talking about regarding the last argument, which is the status quo bad arguments right um it doesn't matter how unlikely medicare for all is to succeed if you demonstrate that the current health care system is going to collapse um because then it becomes try or die um and it's, you're probably going to win those arguments partly because the evidence is strong it describes status quo right like it's if your argument saying oh in the future this thing will happen um, then there's probably not a lot of hard evidence that they're basing it on. But if you're looking at like, no, right now X percentage can't afford it anyway, blah, 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 um, then that's always stronger. I know he is projecting into the future by saying it's going to collapse, but it's rooted really strongly in status quo bad uh, analysis. So that's going to be the key thing to extend, though I know it's going to become uh, a theory debate, right? But um, it was the same with welfare, right? In the UBI topic, the strongest, one of the strong arguments that you want to use when you're AF on UBI is welfare is going to collapse. So it doesn't matter if you like it. It doesn't matter if some experts like it. It doesn't matter uh, if everyone who's on it doesn't want to leave it. It's going to collapse. So our options are to have nothing or have something. And that's what you want to extend that argument 
um, that's how you want to extend that argument. But uh, again, apparently that's not the debate. And all the like computer UI stuff at the bottom of this and the red mouse and whatever, uh, that's not that's not me. That's the in the actual video. The current situation for hospitals is looking disastrous. When people can't afford expensive private insurance, they rely on government health insurance, primarily a program called Medicaid. As Nicholas 20 asserts that 75 million people are on Medicaid alone. Currently, when a patient with government health insurance receives care from a hospital, the government reimburses the hospital, essentially paying for the patent's, uh, patient's care. Unfortunately, Kai 19 reports that under the current system, the government pays hospitals at roughly a 14% loss when this happens. Today, hospitals are operating at massive losses, as Sandburn 2019 explained that the government underpays hospitals by more than $75 billion each year. Master in 18 writes that nearly one third of U.S. hospitals lost more money than they made in the last three years. And the NRHA finds that one third of all rural hospitals are in serious risk of closing because of underfunding. That's why today, Tallinn finds that 11 million Americans live in counties without hospitals. Fortunately, affirming and implementing Medicare for All will reverse the trend through the use of global budgeting. Kai of Health Affairs reports that the 2019 Medicare for All bill would use global budgeting to fund hospitals, a system where the government will pay a hospital. Uh, the other good thing about this affirmative is that it has concrete numbers, right? 27 million. Anytime you can get a number like that, you need to weigh that as directly as you can against your opponent. So the other side has given metrics and has quantified, but they've done it vaguely because they say for every doctor that leaves, 10,000 people die. Maybe that was a statistic. I don't know. I'm not flowing. But, um, but we don't know how many doctors leave. Um... And that's something that I would try to get out of them in cross X before they know that the reason I'm trying to get that number is to do the math, make the comparison to 27 million. Because there's nothing out of the framing of the negative that says why we have to pref like prefer helping people in uh, people abroad over domestic people. Um, which means that in a pure number count, right, if you can show more people are going to die in the U.S., there's 27 million, then you can outweigh um, the people in the third world. And if you're having arguments uh, that are, like, really dependent on a certain kind of impact, like what both of the negative arguments are saying here, like, hey, like, we're talking about affecting people in developing countries, it helps have a framing that argues why these impacts should come first, why it's important that we put the needs of these exploited countries first for once, because I won't get into serial policy failure, but that's the buzzword we use. Directly based on its expenditure. For example, if a hospital faces increasing costs, because it provides care to more people, the government will increase its funding to that hospital to completely offset the increase in spending. This financially protects hospitals from negative profit margins. That is why Kai concludes that the hospitals with patients relying on government insurance would no longer operate a loss in the affirmative world, reducing hospital closures nationwide. In the status quo, when, people, when hospitals close, people are left hours away from the nearest doctor, meaning that they have a harder time getting care. In a life-threatening emergency, this delay could be deadly. Historically, Causen quantifies that when a rural hospital closes, debt rates rise in the region by roughly 6%. This, this is key, as Palliser 20 explains that Medicare for All would save 68,000 U.S. lives every single year. The second way Medicare for All will benefit the U.S. is by protecting the uninsured. Borsky writes that only 8% of American adults have received the recommended preventative care. like regular Preventative care! Diseases, That's the word! Care, due to high health care costs. Kai 20 writes that Medicare for All would expand preventative services for all U.S. citizens, as everyone would gain access to free health care, and Medicare for All would stop the emphasis on last-minute treatment. Moreover, Stockman 18 explains that Medicare for All provisions include preventative services for chronic diseases, and it would be expanded rather than the current system of last-minute care. Currently, Ken Bomb 19 explains that after 15 years of testing, the U.S. has created cures to chronic diseases such as sickle cell disease and muscular atrophy, yet the treatments will likely exceed $1 million for these diseases. Preventative care treats diseases before they get worse, as these treatments will be free of charge. Providing preventative care will undeniably save lives. Levine 19 finds that 7 out of 10 deaths in the United States are due to chronic diseases. Thus, Lemon 20 finds that implementing Medicare for All would save 68,000 lives every single year. Q 
Change the healthcare system and a friend. Yeah, pretty good app. Yep. May I shoot the first question? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, on your uh, contention one, does your 68,000 mm -hmm. lives evidence saved, which you cite twice, does it mention the word hospitals anywhere? No, it just says holistically Medicare for all will save 68,000 lives. So we also okay. have a second impact, right? The second right. one says that one hospital closure leads to 0.6% increase in mortality. You could have left the answer there. We have like a bunch of impacts on why a hospital closure happening right now. Can I have a question? Well, really quickly to follow up. So the reason I asked that, yeah, for sure. To clarify, your 68,000 evidence that you read at the bottom accounts for all of your contentions, though, right? You're saying it accounts for hospitals, it accounts for preventative care, it accounts for everything. It's just Medicare yes, for all. It says that Medicare for all is going to be expanding and it's going to be uh, causing 68,000 lives to be saved. Yeah. Can I have a so question? So last follow up just, for two seconds. If you if you win every oh, argument, sure. you access sixty eight thousand. Just to clarify. Yeah, for sure. Can I have a question? Yeah, all yours. Um, I'm not sure what the strategy there is. I think what um, our friend on the negative is trying to set up is, if I can disprove any of your evidence anywhere in the case, then that means that. You're, you don't reach 68,000 lives. Um, it's... I mean... I don't know what the strategy is... Um, in saying yes, that... The 68,000 lives is accounting for all of my arguments. Um, I think probably also what's going on there is they're trying to say... You save 68,000 lives, not 27 million lives. Uh, that's probably why he said doesn't mention hospitals anywhere. So they're saying, oh, this person is not concerned with hospitals closing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, probably not a good answer to that question. Um, I also doubt that's what the card says. Like, like no, it's based on their research. I don't know why you want to answer it in a way that kind of ties all of your arguments inseparably together because then they can be right against each other. I, I think that was a good question. I think if he is going for the strategy that I think he's going for, then he's using cross X really effectively, which is something that I don't think I've said in one of these uh, round analysis videos, but let's see. Okay. So let's, talk about your contention on medical imperialism right mm -hmm. so you tell me that at the end of your case you say that epidemiologists are key to um, basically stop outbreaks how many epidemiologists specifically are going to be leaving the developing world and going to the united states so doctors in the developing world provide a role of epidemiology uh that's another great um question and it was speaking to a problem that i had with the negative case also, I think it might have been phrased a little too obviously, right? But like, I think it, it invites the negative to come up and explain why epidemiologists will be going, right? Which is probably what um, our friend here is gonna try to do. I think um, a better way of framing that question would have been to say, uh, what kind of demand will there be, right? So people are going to, um, more people are going to doctors, what sort of care are they going to get? Then you say, look, you say that, um, that the harms, the impacts are triggered by epidemiologists leaving, but none of the demand that you talked about is relevant to the work of epidemiologists, so you don't have a link. That's a better way of fishing for that argument than just asking how many epidemiologists leave because if he can tell that that's why you're asking the question this is his opportunity now to get that on the record um and make it harder for you to make this clever uh epidemiologists or argument harder than if you had just said nothing about it so let's see just, but the argument is more along the lines of the Amica evidence, which is why we read Amica followed by Oppenheim. So Amica indicates that when you lose too many doctors, your health system specifically collapses, which includes everything like epidemiologists, like doctors, etc. And the reason that's critical is because what Wait, but I I've seen this kind of often in the rounds that I've looked at, which is 
Like, people will get asked a question about their evidence, and they'll be like, yeah, whatever, that's that evidence. But that we don't, I don't care about that evidence. I just kind of had that in my case. But really, the evidence that I like is this evidence, which, like, what's the strategy behind that? Why is this in your case if, when asked about it, you just immediately abandon it? Um, it probably speaks to the cases not being written with a focused strategy, but let's see. Different things, though. Sure, but they, they perform similar functions. And what epidemiologists do as researchers is they identify outbreaks so that they can be treated by doctors. Regardless, when the healthcare system collapses, you can't treat those infections. Okay, so I would say PC... Again, like, it hasn't made making the epidemiologist's argument easier for the affirmative to make. It's just kind of muddied it a little bit. Um, and given the negative a head start on that but um let's see this follow-up that isn't really a question probably p's are very different though like people that provide care in the status quo are very different from someone that's just going to detect an outbreak how is it that specifically these and then you get the question at the end i always do that like uh, make an argument and then be like uh how is it that what i said isn't true epidemiologists are going to be leaving yeah they're definitively both critical like i said epidemiologists identify the outbreak that's their job and most of the epidemiologists in the developing world are having their roles performed by doctors by people with medical school training so if you lose professors you lose those too but most importantly the argument is just when healthcare systems so this is where um this is where if I was the affirmative, I'd say, so you don't have any evidence that epidemiologists leave. That's great. That answers my question. Thank you. You can ask the next question, right? Like you already got everything you needed out of this. The more you let them talk, the more you're letting them frame the um, round in their favor. Uh, but yeah, you already got the answer you needed, right? He's, he's not answering the question how many epidemiologists leave he's saying well oh the question is how many epi epidemiologists leave it's like well they're gonna lose professors they're gonna lose the entire healthcare system that is the context of them working blah 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 but at the point where you know you're not getting an answer on how many leave you should just say okay so you don't have that evidence that's fine let's keep going um and then what is he gonna say like I do have that evidence. You're like, look, you answered my question. I don't have, do you have a question? That's a great way of not letting people keep talking because it, as long as it's framed as them answering your question, it kind of doesn't look good for them to be like insisting on saying something that you don't need to know. And you're like, look, do you have a question? Um, let's see if he does. It is impossible to treat infectious diseases, which is why they rage out of control. May okay, I that's also, fine. Lastly, the Oppenheim evidence, the part right before epidemiologist, which we read in case, says health infrastructure. Yeah. So if healthcare system collapses. That's well, the way. Oppenheim evidence is just referring to doctors being, uh, to epidemiologists being like really important, right? But there are also well, three no, other no, no. reasons that are being indicated. There's um, <clears throat> when you're having a debate, you're not trying to convince your opponent. You're trying to convince the judge. Your your opponent is never going to agree with you, right? So now is not the time for you to be making this. You don't need to be pointing this out to your opponent. You don't even need to be pointing it out to the judge right now when your opponent gets a chance to speak. You know the argument you're going to make. You're going to come up and say why they're wrong. Do that in your speech. Don't give them this chance to defend against it. Um, Cross-X is not the time for this. Cross-X is the setup. Execution happens in the speeches when it's on the flow and they don't get to respond immediately. It's not just the fact that yeah. doctors are super important. Right. The other so, like, there are three other reasons why they're, like, the best way to, like, out, uh, contain outbreaks. Yeah. The also, that's not outbreaks. at all a question, right? Infrastructure and sanitation, both of which our case impacts, too, because if the healthcare system collapses, they both get worse. Now I'm going to take a question. So, okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, on the evidence you sent me, the uh, Sutvin evidence, it indicates yeah, yeah. that it emphasizes access to primary preventative care um, and transforms yeah. the system. And then it says mm -hmm. that this kind of change is supposed to be a focal point. So does it cite like anywhere in the bill that indicates this, or is it just like this would be a great thing if it did that? Yeah, I would say it says that according to the Medicare for All bill, we're going to see expanded preventative services rather than right now cool. we see last minute ER services that are being uh, that are being like prioritized currently. But it, but it doesn't say like, according that's to basically cross for all bill at all, does it? Okay, that's cross. Yeah. For judges and for the opponents, the order is going to be one off and then down their case. So if you want to get another sheet of paper 
to blow the off, I would recommend. <sighs> that's not really... Like, that's language from other debate formats. Like, technically, I guess you're reading one off because you're not reading the constructive, but that's not your only off-case position, right? You have an entire case. You're, you're introducing a new off-case position. Uh, just to clarify that for people... Um, for people watching the round, the case is the affirmative case. The off case is any is any argument introduced by the negative. So that would include DAs, but it would also include um, theory and Ks. And you can also put certain like arguments that certain arguments can go on either sheet, right? Like you can put solvency on the AF case, or you can make it like its own sheet of paper. Anyway. Oh, also. I say its own sheet of paper because in Parley we flow every argument on its own separate sheet of paper. We don't have like everything on one or two sheets of paper. Um, and the reason for that is because it makes it easier to change the order that the arguments are in or kick an argument. So whatever, we're not going for it. Let me just get it out of my way. Uh, but anyway, let's hear, I think this is the paraphrasing, which... If you're going to read theory on paraphrasing, cross-ex would have been a great time to raise questions about what your evidence says and demonstrate the abuse, right? The whole point of paraphrasing is that it doesn't allow you to clash and it creates confusion and you're not able to verify things. So it would be great if you could basically demonstrate that in the round. Like, instead of it being potential abuse, it's actually like articulated abuse. Like we try to get clarification on this, but we're not able to because you provide paraphrased evidence. Um, but let's see. I'm not. Okay. Then I will start my time now. First off is the interpretation. When evidence is introduced in round, it must be read as full cut card and not paraphrased. B is the violation. They paraphrase. C is standards. First is evidence ethics. Paraphrasing reduces nuanced and in-depth evidence into biased two-sentence summaries, which is empirically proven by the widespread use of misconstrued evidence. Cards and sure tags are grounded in direct quotes and make it easier to check for misrepresentation, which deters cheating. Evidence ethics are key to fairness. They can make infinite arguments through misrepresentation while we are limited to topic literature. Second is more research. What? I, I don't usually do this. I'm going to go back. But the issue with that, the interpretation is fine. It's not a... Uh, the interpretation is fine. The violation is fine. The standard game needs to be cleaner. Um, first of all, you're not like tagging what the standard is. You're just giving an analysis. So what I'd like to hear is like limits, uh, which oh man, these, I just got new headphones and um, the little buds are like elephant ear size. So let me just quickly for anyone watching, obviously everybody in this debate, I don't know, at least this Eli knows um, enough about theory debate to be reading this position. But um, let me just kind of explain how it functions. So. There's four parts to a theory position. And we have a video on this called Topicality and Other Procedurals. Um, the first thing you're doing in a theory position is you're setting an expectation for what should happen or should have happened in the round. The second thing that you're doing is that you're explaining that the other team has violated that expectation. So what you've essentially done is if you created two interpretations of how debate should be had. You've demonstrated that there's two competing interpretations of how debate should be had. The one that you're advocating for in your um, interpretation, the one that the other side is advocating for implicitly through how they held the round or explicitly uh, directly advocating for it when they come up and they read a counter interpretation they say okay let me put our interpretation of it into words what you want to do in the standards is you want to essentially create um, now as the judge I know there's two competing interpretations I need to know reasons to prefer one over the other and the way that that should work is you should give me 
a mechanism for prefer for preferring one interpretation over the other and then apply that mechanism to show why that mechanism rules in your favor so what does that mean one standard is predictability it first argues that debate should be predictable because it allows for greater clash and better education then you explain how your interpretation is more predictable than theirs that's predictability another is like limits the like what limits are like the explanation of the standard is that limits whatever uh the interpretation that limits what arguments could be made in the round more is always going to be better for the debate because when limits when there's more limits you can have predictable ground you can have greater clash um because it's ultimately going to be impossible to have good clash on an, like if the other side just gets up and like starts dancing and says that that's their argument which has been run people have done that um there's been performative arguments for a long time um what I'm hearing here isn't a clear, I don't know what the mechanism we're using is. is. You're just saying that, like, paraphrasing is bad. And you're using terms like, it's been empirically proven by the rise of, like, bad evidence in debate. But that's not an empiric, right? If, if it's an empiric, then it's been statistically measured and is in evidence so if you're just kind of like speaking to like oh this is the general experience and we all kind of know this it's like a gut check it's not like an an empiric if it's an empiric then you can cite it uh which you should this should be a prepared position right uh which sounds like you do have some prepared evidence for this so it would help if instead of saying like, oh, this is a general bad trend that you have actual empirics backing this argument up. Um, but let's hear the... To flow the off, I would recommend that. Okay. Let's hear this again. Then I will start my time now. First off is the interpretation. When evidence is introduced in round, it must be read as full cut card and not paraphrased. B is the violation they pair Did... Did his team read it as full cut cards? Um, didn't sound like it, but okay. Paraphrase C is standards. First is evidence ethics. Paraphrasing reduces nuanced and in-depth evidence into biased two-sentence summaries, which is empirically proven by the wise. What was that? Paraphrasing reduces nuanced. B is the violation. They paraphrase. C is standards. First is evidence ethics. Paraphrase. So evidence ethics is the standard, which like, I guess that's a standard that's pretty decent, but. Phrasing reduces nuanced and in-depth evidence into biased two-sentence summaries, which is empirically proven by the widespread use of misconstrued evidence. Cards and shirt tags are grounded in direct quotes and make it easier to check for misrepresentation, which deters cheating. Evidence ethics are key to fairness. They can make infinite arguments through misrepresentation while we are limited to topic literature. Second is more research. Paraphrasing encourages lazy research practices where teams only find mediocre evidence and then misconstrue it rather than reading more topic literature to find the best evidence. This harms education because debaters learn less about the topic. Third is prep school if we want to know the quote of their evidence. Not only does it require students prep time while they don't have to, but it also takes longer to read through the parts they paraphrase than our quotes. This destroys fairness because it decreases our time to prepare in-round strategy. Voters, vote on fairness. Abuse prevents an objective valuation of substance and the round, which is your intrinsic role as a judge and education. It's why schools fund debate and the only long-lasting value. Drop the debate or hate. Vote for us endorses a positive model of debate. Wins and losses determine the direction of the activity teams. losing. Right, so now that we're in the voters, so you've established there's two competing interpretations. Here's why my interpretation is better. And here's why, if you believe my interpretation is better, you should vote for us in the round. For bad practice and incentivizes change in the future, which makes debate more educational and fair as a whole. Additionally, all of their cards are paraphrased, which means drop the argument just becomes drop the debater regardless. Default to competing interpretations, judge intervention is bad. Then they get no RBIs. It chills theory in two ways. A, we should be allowed to test the legitimacy of the other team. We shouldn't lose for being wrong or nobody would ever risk checking abuse. B, it encourages good debates to be intentionally abusive. People will bait theory and then win off RBIs. I mean, RBIs aren't good. 
those are pretty decent explanations for why RVIs aren't good. <clears throat> Just to quickly touch on why RVIs are not good, um, in my opinion, RVIs create a path to victory through being accused of cheating. So in other words, uh, a theory position accuses you of cheating or being bad for debate. And if you are cheating really explicitly, and that's your whole strategy, the only argument that your opponents can run really are theory positions. So what that means is if you have a path to victory by having theory positions run on you, then you're incentivized to never be topical, never be fair, because that guarantees that the other team has no options but to run theory, and then you read your generic argument against theory, and then you win the debate, right? You're never engaging with the topic, you're not engaging with what your opponent is saying, You have it makes you lose any incentive to engage in discourse. Um, so that's why I and many other people think that you shouldn't be allowed to win by someone accusing you of breaking a rule and just answering that back. Um, I'm sure the pro RVI side has some arguments, and if you have them, put them in the comments. Let's talk about it. Then go to their case. On the top shelf, two turns first. Medicare for All increases mortality as well. 17 finds a recent report generated out of London. The National Health Service paints a grim picture about systemic failings in healthcare of the sickest patients. More than one in three died due to substandard practices, which reveals the sad reality of care, uh, of care quality reduction when resources limit equipment supply for ever-increasing patient volumes. The care was rated as less than good in four out of every five cases. This is this a card being read or is this paraphrased? I can't tell. Like, it's not clearly... Like, it's not how I would read a card. So I can't tell if it's like, here's the tag, Johnson 15, blah, 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 blah. It sounds kind of paraphrased, but I'm not looking at the doc, so I don't know. Tina Forbes finds if giving people government health insurance actually leads to improved health outcomes, states that expanded Medicaid should have uh, should have seen a measurable decrease in mortality rates, but they didn't. This is terminal defense on access because the millions of people uninsured see no decrease in mortality whatsoever. It's also a turn because the hundreds of millions on private insurance get materially worse care. Second turn is that Medicare for all collapses the economy as Carrot 17 of RG explains that if the government can wipe out an industry because it doesn't like the way it's being run, hospital stocks, drug company stocks, medical supply stocks, and medical equipment stocks would probably be affected. This could cause the stock market cra uh, it, it, these stock markets to crash somewhere between what happened in 1929 and 2008. This would be catastrophic because the Great Depression devastated... Also, I don't know if the theory position explicitly said that it was a priori. Um, he said drop the debater. I didn't catch if he did. It's not the end of the world if he didn't say it, but uh, you probably should. And, I don't know, our video on it explains what a priori min means and how it functions in the round. Me starving 7 million people to death in the U.S. alone and dozens of times that many in Europe and the developing world. This also outweighs their argument about access because the medical industry collapses make it impossible to access care, which means we prereq. Then on hospitals, you can prereq it because Medicare's high costs mean less money for hospitals as Baldacci 18 finds compliance with tens of thousands of pages of Medicare rules, regulations, guidelines, billing, and other paperwork requirements consumes vast amounts of time, uh, energy, and effort on the part of the private sector professionals who participate in the Medicare program. If Medicare fails to effectively control waste, fraud, and abuse in the program. This failure of administration results in the staggering loss of tens of billions of taxpayer dollars each year. Without solving for the waste and admi administrative burden, burden, there's no way to ensure hospitals have adequate funding. Then on preventative care, a bunch of responses. First, this argument is a zero excuse me, zero sum game as preventative care increases here, it decreases in the developing world as their link is more doctors in the US. We, for, uh, for our second contention, we outweigh for a couple of reasons. A, we outweigh on severity as people in the developing world have fewer social sa safety nets, which means that the impact of preventative care loss there is categorically larger on magnitude than the impact is here. B, we outweigh on severity. But they don't have preventative care there. That's why you need to read uniqueness arguments that say the status quo is good. There is no analysis in this debate that the care that people in the third world or developing world or wherever areas you're kind of vaguely talking about receive preventative care. 
So, no, it's not a zero-sum game because it's preventative care in the United States, but there's no analysis to indicate that it is pre preventative care in whatever areas that you're talking about. So it's a kind of clever argument. But again, like you just need stronger status quo good arguments, which is why the neg is rough on this topic. Like the status quo just is not good, right? Um, that's why in Parley, we run counter plans when we can't defend the status quo because it doesn't matter what DAs you have if the status quo just is insolvent and the medical system is going to collapse. You just you try or die, right? Like, why not try something if the status quo is guaranteed to fail? Um, okay. Again, as R2 Lanko evidence explains that professors come to the U.S., which precludes any effort to revive preventative care in the developing world. C, we outweigh on magnitude. Our first impact on child mortality is millions dead annually, categorically outweighing their 68,000 people. Then D, we outweigh on probability. Other single-payer countries have had to draw hundreds of thousands of doctors from the developing world to access the same probability they need to prove that other countries saw spikes in life expectancy. They can't. E, we are D, D we outweigh on time frame. We draw doctors in anticipation of higher demand in, uh, in order to avoid shortages when Medicare for All is fully implemented in four years our arguments happen before the bill is fully implemented which means we're more urgent as such we negate one of the problems inherent to public forum where the people who were designing the event didn't really think it through i don't think is that the cross x happens between the two people who gave the constructives in every other format of debate that i'm aware of or care about the cross X happens between the person who just spoke and the person who's just about to speak. That means you can gather ammunition to use in your speech. There was a really, really good cross X question that basically made it so that the uh, affirmative team only really had access to the 68,000 number. And uh, the negative debater in that cross X correctly strategically didn't say that means you don't get your 27 million but that doesn't get mentioned in this speech because this debater just didn't see that argument or didn't notice it in cross x or the communication wasn't there um and i think the only remedy to this in public forum unless how cross x works gets changed which i doubt is you need really good partner communication and debaters need to realize that their questions are to set up for their partners. So for example, in Parley on the college circuit, we've now adopted flex time, which is essentially, um, imagine Grand Cross. There's like two minutes between uh, a lot of the speeches and it's called flex because it's prep but the team that is about to speak can also ask questions but either member of the team that's about to speak can ask questions either member of the team that just spoke can answer the questions what that does is strategically the person who's about to speak can spend that two minutes just prepping their arguments but their partner can ask them questions that give them ammo but in order for that to be effective you have to understand what your partner is going to need or like the person who isn't asking the questions should be half listening and ready to use those in some way i don't see anything in this speech that is reflective of what the cross-examination was another thing i don't really understand about public forum is how like how and when to evaluate drops like did the 27 million arguments, uh, the hus hospital shut down and the 27 million get dropped? The links were refuted. They were like, no, no, the, the we have a turn on this because of administrative costs are going to be too high under Medicare for all. So actually you don't prevent hospital shutdowns. Um, but the link of 27 million wasn't refuted. They don't say that if hospitals shut down, um, people won't lose healthcare, but also I think the evidence said 27 million don't have healthcare in the status quo, which means that even if like we don't prevent more, 
even if the AF doesn't solve, that doesn't change that the status quo is bad. It just helps the try or die, right? Uh, the 27 million isn't something that's going to happen in the future, maybe, and you delinked this kind of like DA situation. It's not an internal link. It's a, it's a uniqueness. It's happening right now. Um, so what I think strategically will or should happen is the affirmative team comes up and just kind of answers the weak links and um, on, on the like uh, the administrative costs go up and say like look your evidence is talking about a different thing right they're not talking about Medicare for all they're talking about status quo med Medicare uh, creating administrative costs right like I doubt that evidence specifically says that Medicare for all uniquely creates high Medicare standards that will create that will lead to like a net closure of hospitals um, so then I think they answer that the evidence that says specific specifically Medicare for all leads to a net hospital staying open probably answers that back and then you get access to that 27 million argument what then will probably happen is like 12 minutes from now in the summary the other negative speaker will try to come up and say hey you said that your holistic argument was 68,000 and that means you don't get access to 27 million because if you were solving for it then that evidence would have said 27 million not 68,000 at that point, it's going to be pretty late in the debate. You only have a two-minute speech unless they change it to three minutes. I don't keep up with this stuff. But also, like, it should have come early. It should have been in the rebuttal. I think every other format of debate would kind of acknowledge that, no, you missed your opportunity to really, like, say that. But, um... Public forum doesn't have points of order, so you, if somebody makes a new argument, it's not even like you can stop the time and say that's a new argument, get a ruling on it, and get it taken out. So just make stuff messy, and it just makes it so that even good judges have to make bad, inconsistent, unsatisfying decisions. But let's keep watching. <clears throat> We're just going to be our case, right? First, right, first in the one-off, right? Then our case, their case. Okay. No, not ready. So this debater is trying to do what in most other formats you would do in the first kind of response speech, which is defend the case and attack your opponent in the same speech. I'm not sure how that works with, you know, public forum norms, but also, you know, and there's also like only four minutes. But even if you were doing that, you probably want to go off case to your opponent's arguments first, um, to the negatives arguments first. Um, so I would have probably had that in the order of paraphrasing then the responses to the first negative constructive in order and then responses to the um, first negative rebuttal. So like defending the case. Um, especially since given the norms of public forum debate, Anything you don't get to in the rebuttal is still well within the norms for your partner to say in summary. Whereas if you don't get to attacking their case, it's going to be harder for your opponent, your partner to like sell new answers to their case in the summary. That's just my take on it. On the one-off, they say there's three reasons why paraphrasing is really bad. They first say there's a, uh, it's a like paraphrasing means it can be more biased and misconstrued. That doesn't matter. It's not unique. Quoting authors doesn't solve because you can just read strawman quotes and then insert brackets to skip around the quote. It's really that bad. If our cards are misconstrued, the only reason paraphrasing is bad is if we're actually lying about it. Uh, yes, but it's easier to demonstrate that someone has 
intentionally miscut a card by bracketing around things that disprove it, thus creating a better enforcement mechanism for actually defending evidence ethics. The problem with public forum right now is that there's evidence ethic rules which say if you're intentionally misconstruing evidence, then you automatically lose, even if it's, I believe, I'm not sure, I don't read the public forum rules very often, though I would suspect I've read it more than a lot of the people who do public forum. I don't know why people don't like read the rules. Anyway, the problem with public forum right now is that there's, it's very difficult and very time consuming to actually demonstrate that a two sentence summary of a 30 page article or research paper like isn't an accurate summary as opposed to no this quote is taken out of context here's some other lines right around it that they cut around so that's not to say that this isn't a fine argument but it's that's how i would respond i don't know evidence and we aren't at that point you we would have to read the shell only if we were lying about our evidence and on the NSA rules check you could just like if we are reading bad evidence you could actually just call for it and challenge us uh, on it and at that point you could just win the round from there on to the idea that it's like uh it's like lazy practice and you don't prep as much it's not um I'll, after this i'll talk about how to answer theory which i don't know if paul's made a video on that but it's it's a talk that he should give, but I'll give my version of it. You need quoting authors doesn't solve because you can still take an article and misconstrue it using like bracketed quotes. It doesn't matter. Then under the idea that it's like uh, it's like prep skew, it doesn't matter because again, quoting cards doesn't solve insofar that you can always take prep pen to read them and then check for starling quotes. Right. I think the argument that you need to be making here that you're kind of touching on is um, don't vote on potential abuse. And the usual like little uh, tag that people throw after that um, is voting for potential abuse is like voting on a potential DA. So here's what that means. Um, the potential abuse argument says that you shouldn't vote me down just because in some instance this round could have been unfair to the other team. They have to prove how they actually were hurt by this in this specific instance. So what the comparison to a potential DA is, is you wouldn't vote against an argument because there's a potential the other team could have found evidence against it or could have said, oh, don't pass this case because uh, I'm. I, it's possible that I could have found uh, impacts to say why it's bad. So by the same logic, you should have to demonstrate what harm actually occurred to the fairness or education in the round in this specific round to your team specifically, rather than just saying, in general, this is bad practice. Um, let's keep going. Because right, that's what we would have to do. Then onto the reason we can't read RVIs. They try to say it's really bad because people can bait RVIs and it's abusive. It doesn't matter insofar, A, we didn't bait it and there's no like, um, there's no like, level for like how to determine if we made it and that's the point though you saying we didn't bait it and there's no way to know if we meant to or didn't mean to bait it probably means that the only way to solve for people baiting it is to always not allow it right we didn't bait it so in this instance rvi should be allowed is only applicable if we have some metric with which to measure whether you meant it or not. But what you're essentially saying is we didn't bait it in this instance, so RVI should always be allowed, even though I'm conceding that baiting it is bad and always allowing it would allow people to bait RVIs. And then second of all, we would argue that in terms of fairness, if you're reading them like here to try to get out of debating the real topic, it would be really bad. Here's why we should win this round if they lose this uh, theory argument. First of all, reading directly from a card that means that you can't be succinct as in reading from an argument because authors will always write things as less concise. Defense. An RVI is offense. I don't... You're just explaining why 
an RVI says that... So, okay. Theory positions rely... Everything in debate is about impacts. It's about voters, right? Theory debate is no different. So when you get to the end, that's not just like random sentences you read. Those That stuff matters, right? It's why the judge should vote on this. And usually those impacts, those voters on theory positions are fairness or like competitive equity and education or some fancier term for it. So in other words, you've made the game unfair or you made the activity less valuable, which is why he was saying um, the negative speaker was saying like, education is why schools fund this and blah, blah, blah without it. Anyway. Um, so when you're reading an RVI, it needs to have an impact. You need to say how by running this position, they have hurt fairness or education in the round. A common, uh, reasoning for this is what's called time suck, uh, which is I have a four minute speech in which I need to get X, Y, and Z accomplished or else I'll lose because of drops. And now I have to answer this position, which sucks because it's not only wasting my time, but it doesn't matter how well I answer this, it's never going to get me a win in the debate. That's really unfair because you're letting them read a position that wastes my time and then they can win on drops, which means that it encourages teams to always run bad theory as a time suck because even bad theory takes time to answer well. Which sounds like a good argument, but I still don't like RVIs. Um, so my point there is your answer to the RVI should not be paraphrasing isn't bad because that doesn't indict them for running a theory position against it. It doesn't show how they created harm by running their position, which is what an RVI is about. Um, unless your RVI is everyone who doesn't like paraphrasing should lose, which I don't, uh, you, you need to read a whole position on that to justify that interpretation and the standards and the voters and all that. Than debaters. First of all, that means you would have to read less argument, which means there's less arguments in the debate. It's less educational. And second of all, you'd have to speak faster because now I have to read an entire like response to this theory shot, which is obviously longer. That's kind of the time suck argument, but I don't understand why speaking faster is bad or unfair or uneducational, right? The whole point of the RVI is framed around impacts and the voters, and that's where your focus should be. And articulated um really well then onto the rvis if we win oh i guess that wasn't the rvi like this offense on the counter and turf and we should win the round because the lack of rvi that the offense on the counter and turf you didn't read a counter and turf that's why i was like we'll talk about how to answer a theory position let me go back and just make sure great argument first of all reading directly from a card that means that you can't okay well... there's no like level for like how to determine if we baited it and then second of all we would argue that in terms of fairness if you're reading them like theory to try to get out of debating the real topic it would be really bad so here's why we should win this round if they lose this uh theory argument first of all reading directly from a card that means that you can't be succinct as in reading from an argument because authors will always write things as less concisely than debaters first of all that means you would have to read less argument which means there's less arguments in the debate it's less educational and second of all you'd have to speak faster because now i have to read an entire like response to this theory shot which is obviously longer then onto the RBIs. If we win like this offense on the counter interp, then we should win the round because the lack of RBI. I don't have a counter interp. The counter interpretation would be saying directly, uh, affirmatives or like teams in debate may paraphrase evidence. Uh, but strategically, you probably want to make um, your counter interp more round specific so you're better shielded from potential abuse arguments. So you don't have to defend every debater in every instance, it's better if blah, blah, blah. So you can say, my counterinterpretation is that, they're the affirmative, affirmatives may read paraphrased evidence on Medicare for all 
when reading arguments pertaining to hospital closures and whatever. And then some reason why that's a unique case. And um, that makes it really hard for their generic, we know that evidence ethics and debate is bad argument um, to apply. And they will have to give much more specific analysis as to why your instance of paraphrasing has created actual harm in the debate where I mean, they didn't ask any questions regarding your paraphrase. I guess they were asking that 68,000 question, but they didn't reference that as being the articulated abuse. <clears throat> anyway, also, the rules of the game allow it. Like, you shouldn't vote down teams for something that's not against the rules. Would be a good argument guys proliferates useless theory. In some of didn't bait it and you can't prove the threshold, we would argue that without RBIs, everyone would be, would be able to read Blippi theory and force us to respond to it, which is really, really bad. This point, is also, like, again, too broad. Everyone would be able to read Blippi theory and blah, blah, blah. Just talk about this instance, right? Because if you can prove this theory is Blippi and abusive, then great, you can win. But if some theory positions could be blippy and abusive, but this theory position is not blippy and abusive, then there's no real reason why this team should not be allowed to read this theory just because some team could read bad theory. So the theory debate needs to be much more specific to what's happening in the round. And I think part of the reason why these arguments are being read this way is because the debaters are reading prepared generic arguments and prepared generic responses um, whereas we don't do that in Parley right we we're used to coming up with arguments on the spot but additionally even like let's say on our college when we have like LD theory positions we phrase our um, arguments specifically, we just leave blanks that you then have to fill in as you're prepping for your speech quickly in the doc. Um, and it's sometimes funny when a college sends in a novice LD or doesn't really know what they're doing and they read theory positions where the violation is like, the affirmative team says blank. Uh, but anyway, that's what you want to be doing with like prepared arguments. You want to phrase them like they're specific, but then you have to plug in something that the team did in the round, which is the sort of thing that your argument is talking about, rather than just trying to talk about generalities because then any team can get out of it by saying like, we're not that thing. Yeah, and we can demonstrate it, right? Uh, not like the, we're not, uh, I they had the other argument earlier in his response that was like, we're not blank, but there's no way to prove that. So blah, blah, blah. Like the, pr the proper response is we're not that. And here's how you can tell. Um, okay. Since we didn't bait, you just should vote on the RBI and vote for us. Then let's go to their, uh, let's go to our case. The other, okay. Um, Paul is going to give a much more in-depth analysis of how to answer theory. There's a seven-step process, and um, he has a lot more to say about it, and I've already taken a lot of time talking about random stuff between speeches in this debate, and uh, so I don't want to take too long, but okay. When you're answering theory, first thing you do is you read, we meet the interpretation. So when... You come up with a reason why there are not two different interpretations in this debate. And if there aren't two different interpretations in this debate, then you can't prefer one over the other. So there's nothing to vote on. That's what the we meet argument says. Um, so this is just how you are an instance of what the affirmative, what the, what the negative reading the position says you need to be. And sometimes it's a stretch. Sometimes it's not. Then you need a counter interpretation, which is what he said he would have and we talked about earlier um affirmatives may paraphrase in the medicare for all topic when reading these arguments and then you read a we meet the counter interpretation 
Uh, after that, you want to answer the standards. You also want to read counter standards um, for why your interpretation is better than theirs. So if they talked about predictability, you want to say why you either are predictable or why predictability doesn't matter. That's the two ways of answering a standard. This standard is bad, limits are bad, or the standard is good, but we meet limits or like a turn where actually more our interpretation is more limiting than your interpretation because ours is specific to a specific argument I don't know um, then you want to introduce counter standards which are your stuff so if they talked about predictability or whatever it is that they talked about in this instance you might talk about breadth of education or um, uh, common person uh, you could have like look paraphrasing makes debate accessible to the common person which is key to having debate appeal to uh, be accessible to lower income schools and uh, minority debaters because your hyper structured hyper whatever normy technical whatever is discouraging uh, to people who just know what they want to say and know what the evidence says uh, but don't know how to cut a card specifically in your format in which you won't like read theory positions because it cut the card slightly wrong. That's one way that you could cut, but like that's one way you could have a counter interpretation here. And then you get into the voters um, and your first uh, answer here is don't evaluate this on competing interpretations. Um, evaluated on reasonability so competing interpretations so there are different ways of evaluating the round right so in a regular round you might have framework that says prefer this on uh, net benefits right so we're gonna have a bunch of arguments they're gonna we're gonna have a bunch of like advantages they're gonna have a bunch of disadvantages uh, or if you prefer we have contentions for the resolution they have contentions against the resolution at the end of the day whoever can prove like if more good happens than bad, then vote app. If more bad happens than good, vote neg. What competing interpretations says is we have two different interpretations and you could, you should evaluate it basically on the flow. And um, like if a standard doesn't get responded to, that creates a link into the voters or the impacts and that's where you have to vote. Reasonability says, look, this is a uh, question of fairness and education in the debate. And if regardless of whether we dropped arguments on this T or whether they had more ink on it than us, if at the end of the day you heard our first speech and you didn't think, wow, this is unfair or wow, this is cheating, then you shouldn't vote on an accusation that we are unfair or cheating just because that accusation was very effectively framed that essentially you should just use a reasonable person's interpretation and in this case that would be in favor of the team answering the um, the theory position and it almost always is right you if you're reading reasonability you're almost always on the side that's making up your answers on the spot rather than the side that has this as a prepared position because if you have it as a prepared position then why would you want the friend like the weighing mechanism to be the one that ignores the nuances of your argument. Um, I didn't count how many things that was. We meet counter interpretation. We meet the counter interpretation. Answer the standards. Uh, counter standards. Reasonability. Probably one other thing that I'm forgetting. Um, cool. I wasn't really like much of a, I mean, there's, there's no such thing as not a theory debater in Parley, right? Like, T's get read, you answer them. Um, but it wasn't my focus, and it was very much Paul's focus. So I just let him focus on that stuff when we're coaching the team. They first say that like by implementing Medicare, like it saw like it did uh, like a lot of people died to lower quality care. We would say a that's because these programs are underfunded right now. And insofar, Carol nineteen explains that when you implement Medicare for all, you see it you see it properly funded. We would say that is the link into actually getting access. Then they say when they expanded Medicare, rates mortality didn't actually uh, like decrease. It um, give me a second, my girlfriend. Huh? 
The problem with this is we would argue that the Medicaid like coverage isn't complete in terms of healthcare. People still have to pay if they're trying to get some like more expensive surgery, and that's really bad because then people don't actually get the surgery they need to deal with the disease they had. Then they say that like stocks would drop because like the government would eliminate a sector. This doesn't matter empirically. Coin Seventeen finds that every single developed country that has nationalized an industry has always bailed out stockholders evenly. This is critical because that would never create a stock market drop. That doesn't link into their argument. Then they say medical policies like a lot of administrative costs and stuff like that. Archer 20 finds in 22 different studies that range a lot of uh, across a lot of political spectrums that Medicare for all was a $2 trillion over 10 years because of a decrease in administrative costs. This is because it streamlines the system and it's much more efficient because of that. Then onto the severity argument on the bottom of the case. They just try to say that their argument is more severe than theirs than ours if they win the argument. But to do that and to win this, they actually have to win their argument. Let's go to their case. First on the taxes argument. First of all, you don't, how are you not mentioning they drop that the current system collapses in 13 years. That's like the most important argument that's in your case. And again, something I talk about a lot, um, where I even earlier in this video, like debaters aren't on the same page in terms of strategy, which I think, you know, like wouldn't prep solve for that, right? Like, I, I don't know, like, do do people talk to their partners in prep? Are they not taking prep because they think it will look lame? I don't know. That's a really important argument to your case, and it is written in the case to be just an easy takeout of the entire negative, but you're not activating that strategy because you're not, you're just seeing the arguments and you're reading your blocks against it uh, instead of extending the key aspects of the case, which is always better because it's not new evidence. It's conceded evidence. So the judge basically has to vote on it. You're always better off extending something that got dropped than reading new evidence because you're, the other team is already framed behind on that topic rather than them now coming up and getting a chance to respond to your new arguments. Well, the PRI-19 finds that after you divert the existing government spending from Medicare and Medicaid to pay for Medicare for all, you only have to increase tax revenues by $1 trillion. Their evidence doesn't actually account for that. This is super critical because currently the average person pays around $10,000 for health care. And thus, for that reason, since you only see a minor increase in taxes and all of that money then doesn't, gone, doesn't get put into health care, you see that uh, households and private businesses would pay 9.6% less. You can also apply the Archer 20 card here that it saves money. Then onto the doctor drain argument. First of all, there's a surplus right now. Antonelli 19 explains that the current amount of doctors working in the U.S. is over, like, we have a surplus of 160,000, um, like, primary care physicians, which is super critical because we would argue the main increase in demand for doctors right now, if you were to affirm, is primary care physicians because those are, those are the people that provide preventative care. They try to say that, oh, it's like there are a lot of them are overworked, but that doesn't matter in so, in, in so far that Desega 17 explains that the current system slams doctors with a lot of paperwork, which causes burnout and a lot of, like, shortages of doctors. Like, or like why they can't like provide more care. So that argument's fine. Like the, it's non-unique because they're already overworked and the current system, blah, blah, blah. But I think the, some necessary analysis here is like, look, you have to vote on their impact to this argument. So at the point where they impact this argument out to be about brain drain, and there's no link to epidemiologists coming, then it doesn't matter what the workload is because they haven't provided an impact for that. Here, they continue that Medicare for all is uniquely positioned to address this because the revenue does not come from like uh, they're like working and comes from the government instead. So the physicians can focus on preventative care while the government takes care of the bureaucracy. This has two implications. First, the preventative care rates are uh, better, and that means for that reason, like you have more doctors. Let's go on to their impact level. First of all. I'm trying really hard not to be mean. Tobias, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job, buddy. But you got you got to read that epidemiologists don't. There's no increase in demand for epidemiologists, so there's no link to brain drain and third world healthcare collapse and like Ebola. Like you, you got to say that. Well, the impact level is talking about a pandemic that happened with like uh, antibiotics didn't even, even exist. And Kim 13 finds that uh, because internets can send information back uh, to the internet, uh, and uh, for that reason, child mortality is empirically lower in the other countries. At that point, they would have to prove epidemi epidemiologists leave. It's a really big impact. Wait. So you did mention epidemiologists, but just in a really unclear way. 
like some stuff about like antibiotics didn't exist then and I also feel like you were probably over time because you did the debate voice where you were like I'm over time so I'm going to bring down my volume but I'm going to keep saying like 15 words just to make it sound like I'm wrapping up but really I'm just adding like nine more sentences um yeah I don't know I think you needed a m much cleaner much more emphasized focus on there is no link between the increase in demand for uh, general practice doctors to a brain drain of epidemiologists in the third world. That should be a really, really big focus. Um, and it just currently isn't. It's 410. That was 410. The last response was administrative you guys paperwork. Went over. You guys went like to 410 and you're lower as well, so... No, Eli's rebuttal was 403. What? This is not a productive conversation. Like, there's no point in arguing with this, guys. Since yeah, guys okay, across. whatever. Yeah. So on this first response on your case about Wells, you say that, like, the program is... Oh, I guess he's mentioning it because he's saying the only mention of epidemiologists was overtime? Eh. I mean, it was, but hopefully that's... That's a judge decision, right? Um, anyway under that that the program being underfunded is like the internal link for the card right what well, i mean like what's the response in the first place this the response is, is that like what? mortality rates rise for what like under what program oh under single payer health care because there's an inability to allocate resources effectively exactly so which which country is that that's the uk correct? that's the uk yep yeah okay cool so in the past like five six years in the uk right how is the uk spending changed is it who is asking the is question here Whose question is this? Because they're... Let's look at this again. I'm pretty sure it's Eli's question. Is under... Are you, this, guys? you guys ready okay, for trust? whatever. Yeah. So on this first response on your case about Wells, you say that, like, the program is under... That, that the program being underfunded is, like, the internal link for the card, right? That question could have been phrased more specifically. Um, and a little bit more clearly, but either way, that's the question. Well, I mean, like, what's the response in the first place? What's the response in the first place? I'm not sure I understand that question, but I also don't see how... I don't know, I think Tobias is just answering questions with other questions, and uh, Eli is letting him do it too much. The this response is, is that, like, way. mortality rates rise. You... So he's saying, what is the, what? For what, like under what program? Oh, under single payer healthcare, because there's an inability to allocate resources effectively. Yeah, exactly, so which, which country is that? That's the UK? Correct? That's the UK, yep. Yeah, okay, cool. So in the past like five, six years in the UK, right? How is the UK spending changed? Is it? So, okay, at this point we've clarified the question, right? The question seems to be, it's not even a question. It was just a setup like, okay, so you talk about this, right? And now <clears throat> Tobias is getting to talk about the UK kind of preemptively. I don't know, kind of messy. Um, I think that's on Eli. I think Eli needs to get his question out. Conservative? Is it limiting spending or is it massively? It's like, is it increasing spending? I also don't like when people phrase questions like this. Like, I have this thing that I know, but I first want to point out that you don't know it. Which, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's effective. It's just, I don't know. I, I, I personally don't care for it. You tell me. Okay. So the UK is extremely limiting spending to their program. Carol 12 explains. That the wait, US wait, wait, okay, wait. program wait, hang on, hang spending. On, hang on. And the reason why you have less resources or like worse health outcomes when you have those like wait. types of problems is because they are underfunded. So in so far so you're wait, that wait, the program wait, hang is on. underfunded, right? You don't win this argument. Just just a second, because I'm a little confused. You said how has spending changed over the last five years and your card is from twenty twelve. No, this okay, like let me just explain. That the Carol card talks about Canada because that's a more like long-term oh. issue okay well in then the uk uh, that's right not when boris 
No, no, okay, yes, but you're missing the point, right? The warrant is. So the argument we're making here is that the reason why these programs like have issues allocating resources X Y Z is because they are underfunded. So and like yeah. because okay. the UK and Canada have a like, conservative mm -hmm. spending, right? If we what, win that it's what, not like the yeah. US is the what, like more what is the to... yeah sure what is the most popular program in the U United Kingdom most popular government program this is another instance of like I know this thing but I'm gonna make you say it I don't know it's just not like what like what's the benefit of this like they're not gonna they're just gonna say you say it so then you say okay I say it and it's like well why didn't you just say it in the next speech Probably because your partner isn't listening to the cross X and isn't going to use any of the stuff that you're setting up. But, um, I mean, based on what we've seen so far. But anyway, it's just not effective, right? The most effective cross X that I've seen so far in this debate is that question about does your 68,000 card account for all your other arguments? And at the point that that's yes, then you say, then you only get 68,000 live saves, not 27 million plus. Um, but the that wasn't followed up on properly. Um, anyway. On both that sides of the aisle. Huh? I mean, either way, I could just show you a graph. The, the National Health Service, funding. they haven't been cutting spending. Boris oh, wait, Johnson that's fine. We and, like, and the conservatives, they don't cut years. spending to the NHS. It's right. been steadily you increasing are asserting over time. that. I will show you a graph after Crossfire that shows they have underfunded it in the past six years. All right, you're just asserting okay. that. I have evidence that says it's underfunded. All right, okay. let's talk about your case on the theory cell that you use, or like at the top yeah. of our case. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So if I were a debater and like, okay. I also feel like in CrossX, if you're like, oh, their biggest spending thing is this thing that I'm just saying now, then it's kind of counter to your we need to provide carded evidence in order for good clash and debate. Which I think is a, another response that was missing from... Uh, like, if you violate your own interpretation, then that becomes a reason to vote both teams down or just more so a reason to just not uh, vote on T. Or on the... You know what I mean, on the theory. Okay, in the rebuttal speech, you spend roughly a minute and 20 seconds responding, or like reading that shell. And then yeah. in doing so, I had to spend roughly a minute 40 or more responding to it, all right? Mm -hmm. At that point, what stops me from reading theory in future rounds to prevent, to like limit the time someone else has to respond to the rest of my rebuttal? But, okay, A. That... What limits is whether there's actual abuse happening in the round. If there is actual abuse happening in the round, then please read theory. But if there isn't, don't. We think there is in this round. That's the answer to this question. Let's see how close you get, it, Eli. It's not what the shell's purpose is. The shell's purpose is to set norms for the activity. My goal is not for you to undercover substance. Is... It's for you to have better evidence ethics. Sure. But again, that's not the argument we're making here, though. In terms of us being able to read an RVI, why can't we say, like, like insofar as you have no like okay back wait, uh, that's reading a bad that's theory time. argument that's time. right that's oh i stopped 255 let me let me ask this question you yeah, can answer, it's right? 305 you started your timer early let me just ask the question you can answer yes because you i haven't been able okay, to ask your question sure, for three minutes. Sure. well yeah because you took two and a half minutes dodging the other question right. but okay right. okay so if there is no consequences for you reading theory why not always read it and always be able to limit the time someone has in rebuttal you can have RVIs. They have conceded multiple. You can have RVIs is not the answer to that. What? Like, okay, back wait, to uh, that's reading a bad theory. Let's hear that that's question right. again. That's oh, I stopped 255. Let me let me ask this question. Yeah, you can answer, it's right? 305. You started your timer early. Let me just ask the question you can answer. Yes, because you I haven't been able okay, to ask your question sure, for three minutes. Sure. Right. All right. So, if there is no consequences for you reading theory, why not always read it and always be able to limit the time someone has in the bubble? Because it also wastes my time. That's it. You can have RBIs. That's very much the wrong answer.
They have conceded multiple pieces of weighing out of Eli's rebuttal. Do not let them respond in later speeches. It is conceded. That means if we win an argument on brain drain, we win the round. The weighing we're going for is A, the probability analysis that every- Wait, what? Three eyes. They have conceded multiple pieces of weighing out of Eli's rebuttal. Do not let them respond in later speeches. It is conceded. That means if we win an argument on brain drain, we win the round. The weighing we're going for is A, the probability analysis that every single other single-payer country, specifically Britain, has seen mass certain increases in, uh, in demand for- How can it be every other country and specifically Britain? Doctors from abroad and hold them, whereas they can't isolate a single country that's seen some increase in life expectancy, so we are more probable. Secondly, on time frame, we pulled the doctors in anticipation of demand, not once the demand has actually started. So we happen before the implementation of the bill. And third, that our number is numerically far larger because millions die versus 68,000 in their world. On substance, go to. Our case. Group every single response. A, they are all mitigation. They should be true in all other single payer countries and the EU, etc. But the EU still had to draw hundreds of thousands of doctors from abroad. So even if they win these arguments, they're not terminal defense. Secondly, the time from analysis supersedes. All of these are effects of the bill, but they've conceded that we pull doctors before the bill passes, which means none of them can solve on the line by line. I'm not flowing, but I don't think that there were arguments that you pulled before the bill can solve. Even if there was, the way you said the whole link story was that there is overworked doctors and then that creates demand. So I don't know why, whatever, that's fine. Their first response is that we have a surplus. No, this is also an example of them miscutting evidence. This is we have a potential surplus, not accounting for a bunch of distributional errors, etc. They paraphrase it, but on the surplus, A, the Thomas evidence indicates specifically with doctors, 80% are overburdened, which means we don't have a surplus, but more importantly, the Bivens evidence specifically isolates for current levels of employment and health spending and finds that accounting for this surplus, we deal 2.3 million. The next thing they say is administrative work. A, the Bivens evidence specifically includes for the projection that administrative work could be made redundant and still finds we need 2.3 million. Our evidence is better than theirs. Then, on the argument of preventative care first off their evidence does not say it solves it's clearly mitigatory second mitigation thirdly preventative care doesn't solve for decades when people have to go to the doctor less because they got the preventative care which means in the short term we still have to pull hundreds of thousands of doctors at that point the fourth response was nowhere near within time i don't even know what it means our evidence isolates for the impact and finds millions die extend the argument the brain drain link is very very clean the uh, because of massive increases in demand for health care the uh, uh bivens evidence indicates we need 2.3 million more doctors and clinical funds have to come from the developing world because uh medical schools are currently full and we need them immediately which kills four people for or four, uh, uh triples mortality for every four people lost um because there's no longer anyone providing care which is significantly more than their impact go to the theory debate it is very simple they don't you put theory on top if you're going for it generally speaking to counter interpretations because the default to us because they have no risk of offense but on the line by line the first thing they say is that they can are uh, they can have our vis will win the show the first thing they say is that we can misconstrue no it is significantly easier to misconstrue when you can use any words you like versus having to misconstrue by cutting out words second our brackets are disclosed on the wiki and visible in cut cards proving this is true third it is substantially easier to hide misconstruction when you force debaters to read massive chunks of highlighted text during prep like they do in the email chain versus having to show them exactly what you read i need to read five lines to see if any of the lines say what they say they though with us we send a card if it doesn't say what we say it does obvious misconstruction that's why it's easier then they say we need abuse. A, their internal evidence is bad, so are multiple other cards in the email. Can't have said this earlier. Check the doc. Thirdly, even if we can't approve abuse, we, you still drop them. We can't check all of their evidence without massively delaying the tournament or being time skewed. Also, we're seeking to promote better norms for all of debate. They can see that misconstruing provides a competitive advantage, which means if we win that it's easier to misrepresent evidence in their world, you drop them. Then they see you can read more arguments. One, paraphrasing enables you to read more arguments. You can cut out warning and misconstrue while simultaneously putting together unrelated ideas from unrelated authors. This short circuits any educational benefit because you're not learning about the real world. We're learning about debate concoctions. Then extend the shell. A, when evidence is introduced in a round, it must be read as full cut card, not paraphrase. B, they paraphrase. C, evidence misrepresentation, misrepresentation gives them access to infinite articles. We're restricting topic literature. You're interested voters, judge right, have to go up to the better debaters, drop the debate. Okay, but you're not. You're restricting yourself to topical literature, right? Like, they do not say you must cut cards. So you can't be like, we choose to do this and it hurts us if not everyone else also chooses to do it. Better set better norms in the future, but it's instead of the practice. Three of two. Um, I don't know. I feel like that could have been more specific to actual abuse in the round. If you're gonna and if you gotta collapse, right? Like I think if you're going for theory, you need to just go for the theory. You're not really extending any of the the only argument is that they don't have a counterinterpretation, which means they don't have any offense. I mean, ugh, they could come back from that 
for sure. And um, I think the whole point on the... I think a lot of... There's a lot of not seeing the forest for the trees, which is, again, super common in not just public forum debate, but at high levels of public forum debate, where it's very line by liney, and it's like, they said this, here's our response, they said this, here's our response. And maybe that's because the judges really just look at the flow and try to look for gaps, right? There's not a lot of, like, actual analysis. And the analysis there should say, look, they've given you no reason to believe that we have tried to skew their time in this debate, right? We're going for this topicality. It's, it's only a time skew if we read a blip and we don't go for it. They said we need to spend a minute, we spent a minute 20 reading this. They said that they spent a minute 40 answering it. And at the point where they've given you no analysis of how that specific 20 seconds was somehow really unfair or bad for education, then there's no reason to vote us down for cheating. It doesn't matter what some team could do with a theory position in some instances if that has not been demonstrated to be what's happening here. Is everyone good? So it's going to be first on our case on preventative care. Um, I'm just going to respond to their responses, extend the uh, contention, and then I'm going to weigh. And then I'm going to talk about their contention on Dr. Drain, and then finally on the theory show. Again, don't put right. theory last. A priori, which is how you ought to evaluate theory positions, literally means comes before. So probably bad sequencing to put that last. They read two things on our case. The first is that the U.S. has worse light, uh, is better life expectancy. But Swanson gives the best evidence. It says that 29% more people live in single-payer countries, and it's holistic. Second of all, we would say the U.S. does not underfund their systems like other single-payer countries. Then, go on to our contention on preventative care. They say they went on the wing. But we would say, insofar that we can still respond to their wing, we would say that our, uh, our wing is going to be, uh, we're going to be winning on the fact that you always want to, uh, group severity and magnitude and say that policy paralysis is always going to matter the worst. The developing countries' impacts may sound really big, but if, uh, if countries always prioritize really big impacts, like nuclear war, but don't focus on the probability of those impacts, then we would say in the long term, they're not going to be able to pr make, uh, provide better bills. That's right. We're going to tell you why the clarity and probability of their arguments is going to be really low on their case. But first, extend your contention, because Borsky says that 8% of American adults receive the recommended preventive care. But when you affirm you expand Medicare for all and give every single person care, which is why we would say that you're going to save 68,000 lives every single year, as 7 out of 10 deaths in the United States are due to chronic diseases. Second of all, uh, uh, that's really key, because we say we win on strength of link because they don't extend any responses to our preventive care argument. Now, we would say, even though we don't respond to their weighing in the first place, we say, Toby told you, uh, Toby told you in his rebuttal that if, uh, we proved you that very low pro uh, clarity and probability we're going to be winning. Let's go into their case. First. This is a really good example of how important being good at cross X is in debate because the best argument in this round is hospital closures. Status quo is bad. The hospitals are closing. The healthcare system, the current healthcare system, will collapse in 2033. It's try or die for the affirmative to provide a better alternative that will save millions of lives that are being lost in the status quo, but also prevent the millions more that are gonna be lost after we have widespread um, infrastructure collapse for healthcare. Um, but the reason you can't go for that is because one cross X question has now uh, made the affirmative has, has to stick to the 68,000 number the whole time even though there wasn't really any specific analysis of that in any of the speeches and 
Like, that argument wasn't even made in the cross X. It's just, hey, is this 68,000 uh, holistic? And the answer was yes. But the analysis never, I don't know. It's doing work for the negative team to say, because he said it is holistic, that means that all of the harms in the status quo are now somehow like negated because one author's research was holistic. But anyway, the answer there could have been a lot better and it is having significant impacts on this round is uh, what I was trying to say. They drop a lot of response. At the end of the at the end of Toby's rebuttal, he says the doctor is able to send back their information and knowledge to the original country. That's very important because when they send back knowledge, money, and more things, we see that these countries actually have a lower child mortality rate and they have more education. We see at the end of the day, brain drain does not cause lower child mortality rates. You don't know how many deaths are going to be there. Old. Second of all, they try to extend that there are going to be a lot of deaths in developing worlds, but they don't tell you how many more deaths are going to come if X number of doctors are suddenly going to leave, uh, leave, uh, leave the developing world. One, their evidence talking about a 2.3 billion uh, billion increase in demand for doctors is talking about healthcare workers. This could be dentists. This could be physicians. There's so many things it could be. It's such a big argument. Second of all, on clarity, they say, uh, on clarity, we're going to be always winning today's round because on the Sega evidence, they try to say that it, our, their Bivens evidence takes into account there's going to be less administrative work. That is not true. We see our Sega evidence says that on net, we're looking at every we're going to see there's going to be nine hours less work for paperwork for doctors because doctors are not going to have to do as much paperwork and talk to private insurance companies. This is very important because insofar that doctors don't have to talk to private insurance companies anymore, we're going to save time on net because then they're not going to be uh, uh, prefer this over their warrant. They just say the demand increases, but insofar that nine hours per week is going to be increasing, we're going to be winning on the comparative. But then, let's talk about the security shell. It's very vague. One, we would say that on prep skew, they can use crossfire to read all of our stuff anyways, so on calling, on calling cards, there's no threshold again for reading it. Second of all, we would say we're always going to be better for education. They don't just want a Toby's counter insert that says that, they're, uh, that uh, we're able to read less arguments when they run a theory shell to win. Because in so far That's not a counter -inter A counter interpretation is your interpretation of how debate rounds should be held. I.E. or I guess E.G. <clears throat> um, teams are allowed to paraphrase. That's a counter interpretation. Um, and then the reason why they should be allowed to do that is a counter standard but not a counter interpretation and that's not just using the wrong word that has implications on how those responses are evaluated on the flow by a flow judge because if you don't have a counter interp that means a specific thing And just saying something is a counter interp is not the same as providing the actual counter interp. In other words, the consequence it's having is we're kind of like, we're given the world of what the negative thinks debate should be. And then we just have why The, what the negative is saying isn't bad but we have we don't have direct offense against here's why the interpretation that they're advocating for causes harm here's why forcing people to cut cards causes harm there's just here's why our world isn't bad but without any specific explanation of what exactly you are advocating for are you advocating that everyone can be vague all the time about everything? Like, what is the threshold that you are defending so that you can more effectively defend it? Um, or the judge can at least evaluate it better. So that's why a counterinterp is important and why what he's talking about isn't a counterinterp. That Toby to spend one minute and forty seconds in his post response to the theory. It's very that's hard. It's not a counter interp. That's the time skew. So on calling, on calling cards, there's no threshold again for reading it. 
Second of all, we would say we're always going to be better for education. They don't just want a Toby's counter shirt that says that, they're, uh, that uh, we're able to read less arguments when they run a theory shell to win. Because insofar that Toby has spent one minute and 40 seconds in his post to respond to their theory, it's very hard for us to speak. But then second of all, we have to speak a lot faster. We have to spend a lot more time. On, in the end, you're going to be winning on the RBI. They can see we can read RBIs. That's very important. Second, lack of RBIs is really bad because they can keep uh, reading useless theories and the team, is, uh, the team that doesn't respond is never going to be winning. Education is always going to matter a lot more than fairs because, we, uh, because uh, they say education is schools fund debate but we would say that on edge we're going to be solving a lot better than they do at the end of the day both of you is probable impact that's going to be on something sixty-eight thousand lives every single year okay you guys ready for grand talk if you have the rvi that's an advocacy in the debate and if you're going for it just collapse to the rvi right none of the teams are really doing an effective collapse which like, if you're doing that in a parley round, it's like, okay, how do we talk about T for the entire 12-minute neg block? In PF, it's three minutes. You could spend three minutes on just the RVI without it being all that difficult, right? You can spend... Like, I certainly spent more than three minutes explaining the RVI very clearly, and I think that's what you should do. If you're trying to win on that, if you genuinely believe that you deserve to win this round because they read this theory position against you, then spend three minutes explaining that. There certainly wasn't a lot of ink on the RVI, and it's a one-shot kill for the F, which the F never gets. Well in other formats of debate the act never gets so what i mean by that is uh there's layers in a debate right um let's say it's a parley debate and it's about like we should get a dog the sometimes people call them gateway issues so you have the main clash, right? The way the affirmative wins the debate is by proving that all in all, at the end of the day, by getting a dog, the world is better off than by not getting a dog. And the negative can advocate for how not getting a dog is, uh, like that specific plan actually makes things worse. So the affirmative can win on that layer if you'd like uh and the negative can also win on that layer but before we get to that is the gateway issue of the plan right like does the plan text have solvency is it possible to implement is there inherency does it not already exist etc right the negative can win there they can say our plan the, your plan like already exists or your agent isn't the agent that is like capable of doing the plan text you're talking about but the affirmative isn't able to win there, right? You can't say, I picked the correct agent, thus I should win. Or, I picked the plan that doesn't already exist in the status quo, thus I clearly win. So the negative has two ways to win the debate so far, but the affirmative just has the one. Next is the topicality debate, where you're like, look, you're not, or like just theory debate in general, right? Like things that are, a level above like the plan tax and stuff like that right where um when you don't count for rvis right you don't get to say i'm on topic thus i win but the negative does get to say you're off topic thus you lose this is what's called a necessary but insufficient uh wow i'm really tired i don't know why i guess i've been working a lot Necessary but insufficient uh, something. But the whole point of it is that, yeah, it's necessary in order for the affirmative to win that they prove X. But proving X is not sufficient for them to win. So, um, an RBI flips that, right? It makes it so that 
the AF can now win on a different layer. They can win on the top layer of the debate. And you should take that opportunity, especially if the team said you can have the RVI. Right? At the point where they said you can have the RVI, and if you prove the RVI, you win the entire debate, right? That puts you in a scenario where you're like, okay, do I have faith that I can win on this RVI? If so, then 100% the best strategy is to only talk about that RVI for three minutes. If you don't have faith that you can win on the RVI, then don't waste any time talking about it. Um, the only reason to talk about the case and the RVI is because you think you might be able to win on the RVI, but you're too scared to commit. And that is why the motto for Paul and my debate team is cowardice is a voting issue, um, which means if the strategy you're implementing in the debate was chosen out of fear or lack of confidence or lack of commitment or not, you know, then you deserve to lose just for that. And uh, that's what we try to teach our kids. And the reason for that is you can't learn how to fix your RVI until you commit to it and then lose, right? Like half committing to a bunch of arguments makes it so that you're never really able to improve any of them. Um, so, for example, like learning how to collapse properly is really difficult because not collapsing at all, you have many arguments and you're talking about all of them for the whole debate, is not strategically great, but if there's an argument that the judge likes, then they always have the option to still vote for it. Uh, collapsing to the argument that the judge wants is the best case scenario, but the worst case scenario is collapsing to the wrong argument. The judge is like, well, I would have voted for you if it said blank, but you didn't, so you lose. So a lot of people will stay in that inoptimal first step because in order to reach the best case scenario, you have to pass through a phase of being worse at it or collapsing to the wrong thing and losing, right? But that's worth it. Collapse to the wrong thing, lose a bunch of rounds, and get better. And win way more rounds when you finally get really good at the collapse, or really good at co collapsing to theory, or uh, the RVI, or whatever, right? Um, and you ultimately need to be goal-oriented. You can't go to every tournament of your career with your only goal to be to win that tournament. You need to have long-term goals, which is something I talked about in another video. And you need to think of everything that you are doing as being in service. Actually, did I make the goals video? I might not have. I got really busy. Whole point is that everything you do in your debate career should be balancing should be aimed at a long-term goal. And short-term goals are only useful insofar as they help you reach your long-term goal. And if you don't have a goal, you end up just kind of like going from tournament to tournament, kind of trying your best and winning some and losing some. But when you have goals, you're able to lose in ways that are productive. If you don't have a long-term goal, you just lose. But if you have a long-term term goal and that involves being able to collapse on RVIs and win, then <clears throat> collapsing on RVIs, losing, getting that ballot is conducive to your long-term goal of being able to collapse on RVIs and win. Thank God for the bottom skip feature because I'm sure I'm... This is going to be like a three-hour video. Mm -hmm. Can I take the first question? Yeah, go ahead. The extension of the administrative paperwork argument is that they save nine hours on net, right? It's combined with that and the fact that given there's an existing surplus of doctors, they're just burdened by administrative work. We would argue that the 2.3 million increase in healthcare workers is not accounting for that. 
So the argument is just that they save time and administrative work, right? It's what's well, that combined with the fact that we have a doctor surplus, but the reason we don't we aren't able to actually take advantage of what it is your yeah. Of okay, what is your so, evidence say the reason we can't take advantage of that supposed surplus is does not say administrative because, work. Yeah, exactly. But you guys say that they are overburdened no. by like they are no. overworked right now, and we tell you the reason they are overworked is because of paperwork. If you can right. read a, like your a evidence warrant for it, that would be yeah. reasonable. But if you don't read a counter warrant and you just drop the argument, it's not a well, like reasonable response to make now in grand uh, Well, no, no, I'd be happy to read the counter warrant that your evidence gives, which is that it's a distribution error, has nothing to do with administrative paperwork. So this is another example of misconstruction where you're saying the reason why there's a supposed surplus, but it's not actually a surplus, is administrative paperwork. But your evidence Again, doesn't indicate the that at all. Card is the, no, the Tesega card is really specific in saying the reason why doctors are overburdened right now and there is burnout is because of the fact that we that's true. have like long hours of paperwork, yes, right? But your and evidence that the main reason, mm -hmm. again, given that the main reason that the like doctors aren't able to work at full capacity, that's the argument we're making. What again, is your this evidence? is reasonable to argue if you read this in summary, but if you drop the argument in summary, you can't come and make a new well, response in grand. No, 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 no I, 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 I didn't drop the argument in summary. Right, can I ask a point question? Point. Because like we're halfway through class. Sure. Yeah, I mean, nothing against any of these kids. I they're all um, my hero. But, um, yeah, I think what Tobias is doing in this instance is dodging questions in really roundabout ways and then being like, oh, man, we've wasted so much time. Can I get a question? It's like, well, you didn't answer the question, and that's the reason why we've spent a minute and a half on this, right? Like... And whether it's intentional and strategic or unintentional, I can't say. But I, when you're on the other side of this, the, it's on you to get an answer, right? So I think the question, what does your evidence say about this, is not effective because you're giving him the platform to then take a minute and a half to introduce all the other evidence that he's going to go for. So... Um, the question that you can ask is, can you point to the evidence you read that says Medicare for All resolves for distribution issues? And then he'll say, what do you mean? And you'll say, which piece of evidence do you read that shows Medicare for All resolves for distribution issues? And he'll say, well, that's not what we're saying on this argument. What we're saying is blah, blah, blah. And he's like, okay, so you don't read that. I just want to clarify. You don't read that. And he says, well, here's my argument. He's like, no, you answered my question. That's fine. It's. I think I would like love for you to get a chance to ask a question. That's more effective than trying to be like, can you tell me in your words that you should lose the debate? To which no good debater will ever say, oh, my my evidence says that it's a distribution issue. Oh, shucks, I didn't respond to that. I should lose. You're right. right? Like, you're, your opponent's just not going to take the bait to say that they're wrong. So I don't think the aren't you wrong questions are um, particularly effective. And I think this round's a demonstration of that, right? Like, it... Either they'll say, no, I'm not wrong, or they will just focus on the stuff that they do want to focus on and burn cross-ex. All right, let's talk about your argument on brain drain, right? Mm -hmm. On In terms of probability, you say every time you know a country has implemented single-payer mm -hmm. healthcare, they pull you know, people from the developing world, right? Mm -hmm. In so as far, you're trying to argue it's a really probable argument. In those scenarios, how much did child mortality increase in those areas? Our Telenco evidence isolates that millions died as a result. If you'd made this response, we would have frontlined it by saying, Crook 16 finds that there are 16 million excess deaths in the developing world because of lack of health care, which is why the Delal evidence in our case finds that there's one doctor per 10,000 people because they've been stripped. But okay, I guess. Oh, yeah, which which countries question? and like how many are going to be leaving from each country? Okay, yeah. All of this is conceded analysis. Can I take a question? Thank you. No, I mean, it's not. The argument so, we're making right now is the fact that when doctors have the ability to send money and information back over the internet, mm -hmm. child mortality decreases when you have more doctors abroad empirically, right. according to... Clinton. I mean, the argument is... The right answer to that is it sounds like it's non-unique, right? Like, 
the negative needs specific analysis that says in the status quo there are areas where there are doctors uh, and children who are not being killed but that's on the brink because the current level of brain drain from uh, like the brain drain threatens that uh, the link is your plan causes brain drain which activates that risk and then causes these numbers of people to die but right now the argument is like brain drain has caused people to die before you are brain drain so people die somewhere and that just doesn't have uniqueness so, right. so even if it's an empiric and holistic analysis of the developing world, why does this all of a sudden change when you like pull more doctors as well? So the Clemens right. evidence this is historically a true argument. The Clemens evidence is 13 seconds over time in rebuttal, and more importantly, it's definitely reverse causal. Clemens finds that countries that have sent more doctors have lower mortality because those are the much wealthier countries that can afford to train more doctors. If you so then yeah, why wouldn't? But I guess he's gonna say if you'd read that, that would be. Uh, good, but you don't read that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that kind of takes out the, like, you're going to pull the last doctor in Ghana. It's probably not. It's probably going to be a thousand doctors from India or somewhere that has, you know, better medical infrastructure and more medical schools. Read this. We, like, never heard this. Okay, first of all, that's not I'd true. Have second of all, yeah, you're just, okay, first of all, you're just all asserting right. that. That's not what the evidence says. And second of all... Also, no one is spending any of this cross X time talking about the theory or the RVI, which is allegedly like a voting issue in this round. And something that a judge has to resolve before they can make a decision on this, uh, on these issues anyway. Because before the judge can decide whether they believe the brain drain argument, they have to decide how they feel about cut cards versus paraphrased evidence, right? I mean, that's just the sequencing that happens with theory arguments and why they should have said that it was a priori and explain what that means. But what that means is there should be no instance in this debate where the judge says, you know, I believe that paraphrasing is bad but I think brain drain is worse, so you lose, right? Because one of those things is a post-fiat hypothetical thing that happens to hypothetical people, and the other one is like proximal impacts that happen to the real people in the real round. And theory argues that we should put that first, right? Uh, so it should never be the case that you one the time suck argument and that the other team was unfair to you but you drop this thing the other thing that i would do is hammer home how much this um debater from bethesda um is focusing on like being overtime which proves the abuse on the rvi right like that would prove the impact that 20 seconds had. Like, look, you caused us to spend 20 seconds on this debate that you didn't have to. And as a result, some of our arguments that you concede would have taken out your case came, in your words, 13 seconds late. And that proves how you are cheating in this debate or how you are unfair or bad for education. Um, I think the negative debater speaking is a really good debater and I think he's probably doing his job the best of everyone I'm seeing in this round. So I guess that's probably why most of my analysis is framed around how people should be answering it. It's not that he's the most wrong, it's that everyone else's answers to or extensions of his speeches are like frustratingly like not frustratingly everyone's learning and i'm happy to witness that but they're just it's not there yet 
he that's not to say that he's the best debater in this round necessarily there's there's lots of uh issues that i have with um his case and positions he's ran and stuff like that i'm not gonna pick any favorites but anyway that's my um man i'm really rambling today you guys enjoy this i don't, I don't see okay yeah, this is just dropping summary. Okay. I think that's cross, is it? Alright, that's all the prep we're gonna use. For clarity, the order is gonna be starting on the shell, then our case, then weighing. Is everybody good? Okay. Then I'll start my time now. First, extend the shell. A, when evidence is introduced in round, it must be read as a full card card, not paraphrase. B, the violation they paraphrase. C, is the standard we're going for. Evidence misrepresentation gives them access to infinite arguments while we're restricted to top of literature, massively skewing ground and fairness. D, is the fairness is a... Again, you're not restricted to that. There's no... No one is restricting you to that. No one is saying you must not paraphrase. Voters, judges are asked to vote for who the better debaters are, and no one would participate if the activity wasn't fair. And education, it's intrinsic to debate, and the reason schools fan... You're trying to change the norms and saying no one would participate if debate wasn't fair. How does that make sense? You're you saying debate isn't you're saying debate isn't fair. The fact that it's not fair is the norm and I am competing in debate, right? Like usually when you say the people wouldn't compete in it, you're saying you're you're establishing a bad norm that would cause competitors to no longer compete. That argument doesn't work if you're saying the current norm is bad and people won't compete when that's demonstrably not true. And the activity E is drop the debater to set better norms in the future by disincentivizing the practice and drop the RV comes drop the debater because every card they read is paraphrased. They extend that we can use PEP. This doesn't respond to misrepresentation. Also, you're extending stuff that they didn't have any responses to, right? Like, like this analysis on how drop the argument becomes drop the debater, like you're just reading off of a sheet of paper without any real adaptation to what's actually happened in this round which a speech like this would really benefit from an a but it still links into prep skew because we have to use cross to read large chunks of text while they can use it to prep but then on the rpi they have conceded a ton of defense there's no way they can win here they have conceded that the reason you can read more arguments is because you cut out warranting and misconstrue while putting together unrelated ideas from unrelated authors specifically this means your additional arguments are not educational thus do not link them to any offense this is just so the argument on the RVI is that the arguments that you didn't get to read are bad anyway. So it doesn't matter if you don't get to read them. But that's sequencing the debate incorrectly <clears throat> because an RVI only matters in a scenario in which I've already decided I'm not voting for the um, theory position, right? There's no scenario in which I believe the theory, I'm gonna vote on theory, but then there's an RVI that's like, oh, now I'm actually gonna vote on the theory I agree with, but the team that ran it loses. An RVI only functions <clears throat> when the judge isn't voting on that theory. And they say, if you don't like this theory, then the team that ran it loses. So how does this mess up the sequencing? The reason it messes up the sequencing is the only scenario in which I'm considering the RVI in the first place is when I have already decided that I don't think these arguments are bad. So the argument that your arguments are bad anyway is messing up the sequencing. And that's kind of a tricky thing for some people to get with um, theory debate. So I'll explain it with topicality. Um, let's say that in this debate, the affirmative runs um, that we should um, pass I don't know, Kanye West's Medicare for All plan imagining he had one that is called Medicare for all, but is a completely different thing. Or maybe it's not even called Medicare for all. Maybe it's Pat's healthcare plan. That's called, I don't know, college dropout was good. 
Um, if you're reading a topicality on that, what you're saying is this is not on topic. If you agree that it's not on topic, they lose automatically. When you then move on to your arguments, you should not be reading answers to why Bernie Sanders's Medicare for All program is bad. Because if I believed that Bernie Sanders was the topic that we're talking about, then you would already win on the theory sheet. We've only moved down that gateway issue, moved into the layer of like the topical clash after the debate has after the judge has resolved how they feel about the theory position. So your arguments outside of theory always assume you've lost the theory debate. So in that instance, your, your like counter contentions or contentions or DAs or whatever need to be engaging with Kanye West's plan because the only way that the judge cares what you say on that part of the flow in the first place is if they believe that Kanye West's uh, plan is what we should be talking about, which is another important reason to set talk about theory arguments first in your speech. That way you can say, look, we don't think this is fair. We don't think this is topical, blah, blah, blah. Vote them down just on this. But if you don't buy that for whatever reason, we're going to have the debate. And that keeps that straight. You're not mixing the levels here, which is what's happening. Because the answer that your arguments are useless because they're still paraphrased, so it doesn't matter how many more, how many you didn't get to make, is predicated on an assumption that the theory wins. And if the theory wins, we wouldn't be looking at this part of the flow anyway. Another reason why it's a prerequisite to substance debate because if the debate they're advancing through this model is neither fair nor educational, it doesn't matter. So, yeah, theory comes first. Then on the substance, on our case, group every response they make. They have conceded that to avoid any shortages when Medicare for All arrives, we pull doctors immediately, which means they can't access decreased paperwork or increased preventative care. Additionally, they concede that these responses are wholly mitigatory because they should have uh, happened in EU countries, but those countries still had to draw doctors. On the surplus, the Bivens evidence says accounting for current levels of spending and employment, meaning even if there is a surplus, we still need 2.3 million doctors and nurses on top of that. So, uh, they, they say it says healthcare workers. Bivens isolates doctors and nurses two lines down, and this is new in, in second summary, which is unfair. Secondly, the, uh, the warrant for the surplus in their evidence is distribution of doctors geographically, not paperwork. On paperwork, they have conceded that Bivens accounts for the projection that administrative paperwork could be made redundant and then finds that we need 2.3 million doctors. Again, our evidence is better than on the turn. It was over the time. Don't evaluate it. It skews our fairness because we stay within speech times. Extend the argument. What Bivens tells you is that we need 2.3 million doctors uh, to, to cover increased demand for care. And Tulenko says that the American medical school system is full, so we have to pull them from the developing world, which is tragic because Tulenko terminalizes that losing four doctors per thousand people triple, triples child mortality killing millions this is conceded to be the most probable impact because it's happened in 17 other countries and outweigh on magnitude because it's millions versus 68,000 it's a very clean neg ballot it's not it's not that it's We're not a neg ballot the, the it's just that it's in no way clean is anyone not ready especially when we relink into the rvi again Reverse on the theory shell, they try to say that you like you would limit the time in crossfire that you would be able to read evidence, but it doesn't really matter insofar you still have time in crossfire to read the evidence. And we would argue in terms of increasing education, it's more important because given that you can't even read enough arguments in rebuttal to actually respond to their case, it's not educational at all because then you're just stuck debating this theory shell that doesn't have any value in the round. At that point, we would argue that we would win the RVI. They try to say, oh, by cutting out warranting, like the arts are not as legitimate, but it doesn't matter. In debate, you still need warrants, so it doesn't allow you to just cut out warrants from cards. You need to extend a warrant that is attached to the card in debate. That's just fundamentally how it is. At that point, we would read our counter trip that says in rebuttal, I'm like I'm forced to read less arguments because I have to respond to the theory shell. At that point, it's less educational. And we would say the education is the reason people debate not for the fact it's fair again the... just to clarify that's not a counter interp that's an rvi it's a reverse voting issue the reverse voting issue is that you're forced to answer stuff and then you have drops and stuff the counter interpretation is paraphrasing is allowed 
debate and like you, you do debate because the educational is beneficial for your education. At that point, we, w we would win the RVI because you would want to drop them because it just allows them to read these blippy arguments without actually ever being like punished. And for that reason, you should just drop them for reading. And them. again, this is all generalized too much to it allows them to do this. It allows them to do that. But you want to focus on proven abuse, which you have in this round. They they've conceded they say themselves that they cost uh that they caused a 20 second trade-off and then they got out of a bunch of our arguments that took out their case by saying it was 13 seconds over time so they've conceded that if i didn't have to spend 20 seconds more than they did i would have had arguments that would have been useful to me in this debate that's the rvi so yeah, don't talk about hypotheticals that could happen. Talk about what actually happened in this round. Purple theory. At that point, let's go to RK. They just clean drop this and try to outweigh it. So the way we should win on the policy paralysis weighing that Ari extends in summary. The policy paralysis explains that when you have these super large, vague, but large magnitude impacts, the U.S. government would only look to like nuclear war impacts every time they pass a policy, which is why they would just never pass policy in the like in, in that sense. This is really critical because that means we need to um, like emphasize clarity and probability in this round. This is crucial because Lemon 20 explains that 68,000 people die every single year because they don't afford health care. And for those reasons, when you affirm and implement Medicare for all, which is free. Like, that's not the argument you should have been left with. The argument you should have been left with is they have conceded that the current healthcare system will collapse in 13 years, which means it's try or die to replace it with something better in the meantime. Um, but yeah, hopefully you recognize that. Healthcare, those 68,000 people will survive every single year. You're saving 68,000 lives. Let's go to their case. The issue on this is on clarity. First of all, even if we can see that there's a, like, more doctors are pulled, first of all, the Bivens card in terms of weighing doesn't actually say doctors and nurses. It's talking about healthcare workers. It's super vague how many doctors you take. But the second of all is the Clemens card, which is clean conceded in the round. Kim 13 explains that when countries, like, doctors leave countries, they can send back money and information on the internet, which allows for these uh, areas to develop even more. Because of that, Clemens finds that there are, when there's more doctors abroad, there's lower child mortality in that area. And at that point, since he's looking at all countries that have done this, it's the most holistic, even if they can pick out specific examples where it's bad. At that point, still prefer clarity it's drop meta wing of why you prefer clarity over anything else so for those reasons we'll only 68,000 lives that are saved in the affirmative world good round good round y'all it's up to both teams for getting here decision is a 2-1 for the affirmative from Leland I didn't have uh, time to process my thoughts on that okay so ah uh, uh, okay there's very few there's no clear presumption in public forum debate in a let's say parley debate it's the affirmative has the burden of proof so if i don't feel confident that they've proven their case the negative wins so in other words ties go to the negative there's no clear reason why a tie goes to the affirmative or the negative so when debates feel like a tie debate uh, judges either have to do a lot of work to try to say why the winning side wins or they have to make their decision on something insignificant or arbitrary which is in my opinion a major reason why people complain about judges in public forum so much it's because they've been put into a position where they don't have any effective decisions, right? Like, I don't know. I just feel like a lot of the people who complain about bad judge decisions aren't confident enough about it to post a video of that round and have people be like, look, this was clearly a bad decision. I'm not saying bad decisions don't happen. I'm just saying that it would shock me given this infrastructural problem in the design of public forum, if this wasn't causing judges to be forced to make unsatisfying decisions. So given that, I imagine some percentage, likely a high percentage of decisions that people feel are bad is more the fault of the event than it is those specific judges. But I'm still sure that there's bad judges that have made inexcusable decisions. Um, 
Uh, okay. So, like I said, it's going to require making, doing work for the, um, for one side or the other. So, for example, on the RVI, I could say, no, you proved the RVI was true because you tried to take out their arguments by saying that it came after they were 13 seconds overtime and you yourself said that they, or you conceded at least, that you caused a 20 second deficit. In theory, I could vote there. Um, another place I could vote is just on the paraphrasing because the RVI doesn't have any, like they don't do that work I would have to do that work. So if I don't do that work for them, then I could vote on the paraphrasing theory because you don't have a counterinterpretation and you have um, only like vague answers as to like why the negative running theory could be bad in some instances and no reason why it is bad in this instance uh, where the negative does point to, you know, the, here's how it affected us in this instance. We don't have time to examine their evidence, but they can easily examine our evidence. Again, nobody told you you had to cut cards. You're the one saying people should have to cut cards, but whatever. I could vote there if I don't vote on the RVI. If I'm looking at the case, a place I could vote for the uh, affirmative is actually that 68,000 number. And it doesn't get brought up in the debate, but the only way... Think about it, right? We're using that 68,000 number to say that millions of people won't die. Uh, so in other words, the affirmative is one argument that says millions of people are dying right now because they don't have access to rural hospitals and more hospitals are going to close, which is going to cause millions more people to die. They have a second argument that says Medicare for All is going to save 68,000 people. So then the negative is like, look, you can only use the 68,000 number which proves that your millions of lives is untrue. That's clever, but then the negative is saying, yeah, but also it's going to cost like a lot of lives, which you've conceded that the 68,000 number is true, which means that probably no domestic lives are going to be, like you have to buy that 68,000 lives will be saved in the United States, at which point, yeah, I think there's not enough uniqueness on the, uh, on the uh, brain drain argument that gives me probability of the same like confidence level that 68,000 kids are going to die from, I don't know, whatever it is that they're going to die from. Um, in wherever they're going to die. So that could be a vote for the um, affirmative, or you could just look to the brain drain argument and feel that you are satisfied by that level of uh, link work because of whatever reason, and then you could say, okay, well then, I don't know, it's magnitude because you cause tens of thousands and that's more than 68,000 because you take an unspecified number of doctors from an unspecified number of places and I'm gonna imagine that that number is higher than 68,000. Regardless, if I've shown anything, is that at least to this judge, who I think I'm somewhat competent and somewhat qualified, this doesn't feel like a clean debate. And hopefully I've clarified where the debate could be cleaner and how. I think everyone in this debate is wonderfully talented. Um, I I wish the best for all of them, and I hope that they have uh, a wonderful life, and that if they watch this video, they feel that I've been constructive and not uh, mean, because I don't want to be mean. I want to be constructive and helpful. Um, let's hear some judge feedback. I will go first because I squirreled. Um, I really negative the head on um, all of the issues around. I look at the theory debate first. Neg is the only comparison between theory and substance says that it comes first because it checks how substance works. I hear Neg's warrants are that um, mis like paraphrasing lets people misconstrue arguments and misrepresent them, whereas Neg is limited to topic ground because they cut cards. 
I don't hear any substantial response to this in the summary of final focus, except a new thing from the summary that we can use cross to recharge, which is responded in the summary in the next or in the next final focus, because of course it was new in second summary. Um, app final focus responses to this aren't really sufficient, just saying that like you still have time to cross to read it, which is essentially just extending it through ink. Um, plus, I don't see how this checks back on the neg argument that about ground, but right, even if you can read their evidence, it's still evidence that is outside of the topic area that the neg is limited to. Um, I then, you know, by the rest of the spell that was extended, I don't think that um, neg is doing enough job, uh, a good enough job on this RBI slash counterinterpretation debate either. They say you can read more arguments. Neg has a response and summary thing. You can read unrelated things that is not improving education, um, which is extended in final focus and after it extends straight through ink. Um, final focus has a new response saying that you just still need warrants, but the warrant that I heard for this was that's just how it is, which I don't think is a good response to what the neg says about limiting topic grounds. Um, also, I hear a brief argument from the app that like this is you should drop them for reading bloody theory, which um, is still like just an RVR argument that is contingent on you winning theory debate, which I don't think that you do. So already I would just vote for the neg on the theory debate. Um, on the case debate, I think that the neg is... Well, I, okay, I think hopefully there's just feedback. <laughs> um, there's a world in which you can be justified in disagreeing with this, and there's a world in which you can be justified in agreeing to it. And ultimately it's on the debaters because any... <clears throat> It's, that's the definition of a messy debate, right? Like, where you could say that this judge's decision was uh, not right, even though the judge is always right. We've said it a million times, but let me just say it again. Like, the, the job of the four debaters in this debate is to convince the three judges in this debate. And there's no rule anywhere that says how the judges must be persuaded. If the judge wants to see who can clap the most times in four minutes, start clapping. Because that's the activity. You don't dictate what persuades other people. And if there's one thing that you take from this and apply to your real life, is you don't get to dictate what is persuasive to other people. That's not how persuasion works. You need to appeal to what they find persuasive uh, and what their beliefs and biases are because no amount of like it doesn't do you any good to say well that should have persuaded you but it didn't so go to hell right like that doesn't do anything for us anyway i think where my where the messiness of the debate and where i think this um judge is doing a little bit of work for the negative is where he says that the negative is constrained to the topic because they cut cards but that's not what a constraint is everyone's constrained to the strategy they used because it's singular right like nobody can run every strategy possible uh because even if you run every argument, that's still one strategy to run every argument, right? A strategy is always singular. You can't run every possible strategy. So the only way for a strategy to be a constraint is if you can demonstrate that the other team gave you no other option of going for other strategies. And I don't think the affirmative team did that. I don't think the affirmative team said or did anything. I mean, if their counterinterpretation was all teams must paraphrase, uh, then that might have been something. But yeah, I don't think there's, without doing some level of work, um, enough here to buy the argument that that the negative must have, like, had no choice but to do this. With that said, Maybe this is an example of doing no work, and in this case, the neg read theory and the affirmative wasn't as good at answering theory, which means the neg won, regardless of really what the substance says, um, strictly from a competing interpretations view, which is a fair decision, definitely. Wing, which is, you know, higher order. Um, the five wing and mechanisms from the neg and second rebuttal go completely conceded in the app rebuttal and just say they have to win the argument. Um, and I don't think it's very nice of the app to come back in the second summary and say, just kidding, we're going to respond to these. Um, the new wing mechanisms, I think the problem with the neg app meta wing where they say 
prefer policy paralysis is that one, you're not doing enough comparison for why you do win the wing mechanism you say is more important. Even if you believe clarity and probability is more important than magnitude, I don't see that you win clarity or probability, especially because the egg has read a reason why they have higher probability that every other country had increased in doctors, whereas you don't have any empirics for your side. So even buying your framework, I would vote on the egg. But also, I don't believe that you do enough warranting for why policy paralysis is the reason I prefer clarity or magnitude or stuff. And additionally, I think that this like clarity thing was kind of just a vehicle for you to read new responses in the second summary, which I felt like a lot of the stuff on their case was. You, like reading you into Divins, for example, which, about, which was kind of like construed as an issue with clarity, which um, I think is a little bit late to be making case responses. Um, and then additionally, I also question how strong your clarity is when the uh, final focus explanation of the case was just um, like people get health care and 68,000 don't die. Um, so especially compared to the NEG, which has clean extensions of their case and like the warranting for it, I would still vote for the NEG under the weighing mechanism that the app is. But I don't have to evaluate those because the NEG's weighing mechanisms are read in second rebuttal, conceded, and extended in two speeches. Um, so I would look to the NEG case first, um, where I think that the top of the response that the second summary puts on the app defense is, well, not only go conceded in the app summary and final focus, but do take out whatever response the app says. Um, and I think the one thing the app kind of has going for them is this thing about sending back information and knowledge, which is over time, a paradigm solution says, I don't blow over time thing. And the neg final focus anyway gives you a reason why you shouldn't evaluate over time things. Plus, it's not weighed, right? You're not giving any comparison for why this is a better way to vote than what the neg's warranting was. You're just saying I have a contradictory point um, without telling me why I prefer it. At that point, I'm still going for this like tripling of child mortality thing from the neg, which is the most weight impact in the round. The only thing that has exclusive comparison in the round and is the cleanest link chain in the round, especially given that I like would even hesitate to vote on the explanation of the app case that we get in the final focus about just. Um, vote for me in 68,000 don't die. Okay, so there's some things in this uh, decision that I don't necessarily, isn't how I would vote. For example, I don't consider a weighing mechanism dropped if someone adds a opposing weighing mechanism, right? Because, yeah, you haven't given me a reason why uh, that's bad, but you have given me something else to consider. So it's you can't just say, and thus I have no reason except, I have nothing, um, I have no reason not to believe that this is the best weighing mechanism, which like they introduce another weighing mechanism. I think that responds, but that's kind of like a very small, minute thing. This is a great, very well informed, very well thought out, very, um, carefully worked out decision and it's the squirrel which demonstrates like why messy debate is bad and why you want to collapse to issues if you collapse to one question every judge has to debate on then you're way more likely to get all of them to say you're right you do win that one question or all of them to say no i don't think you won that one question Rarely you'll have a judge to be like, look, here's why I think that, but that'll always seem very like, you know, like outside, like doing work for the debaters. But when you have arguments kind of all over a place, uh, you have everyone's going for basically all their arguments and the theory and the RVI, you get a bunch of judges that make a bunch of different decisions. Judges tend to make the easiest decision available to them. And you can hear that in the last decision where you're like, uh, where he's like, uh, you know, I don't evaluate these things because um, I don't have to. Um, most judges, at least, make constantly the easiest decision available to them because they're not trying to live out their debate heyday where they um, can prove how good they are at debate by how sophisticated their um, RFDs are. Um, which is why first year out judges uh, kind of drive me crazy. But um, every judge will make that easy choice a different way. The more potential ways for the judge to decide on a round, the more chaos you're introducing into the round and the more random you make the outcomes. But if you can make it like, look, this comes down to this issue. If you believe us, then vote for us. If you don't vote against us, that makes it so that every judge will focus a lot more on one thing. 
And if they buy that framing and your argument, then you're probably going to pick up all of those judges. Um, maybe they buy your framing but not the argument, or they don't buy your framing and then they have to find something else to vote on. But collapse is always going to be an effective tool when done well. And in order to get to a point where you can do it well, you have to suffer through a point that where you're doing it badly. So that's how you felt around and I believe that. I'm gonna go really quickly, if, if you don't mind, and, and just say I'm a lay judge and uh, uh, you're spreading basically neg just was very difficult for me to follow and all this flow lingo and all just just was not easy for me and uh, I just honestly couldn't even put down your contentions and I know you've had a lot of good responses but I had to literally go to all your cards and you know look at your whole line of reasoning and all and for a lay judge that's just too overwhelming so sorry for that but you're great speakers and unfortunately I had to give it to that. That is 100% a valid decision. And if I was on this panel and this judge made it clear before the round that she is a lay judge and those debaters decided to knowingly debate in a way that didn't give this person real access to the round, then I would vote them down with her, even though I could keep up. Um, public forum relies so deeply and fundamentally on the charity and goodwill of people like this who allow for the activity to exist by giving up their time. And that's a really big ask of people who are like adults, right? Like look at the ages of coaches. How many coaches are above the age of 30 and don't have uh, like stable positions? <clears throat> it's it, like like a school position or like a high salary, like, like just volunteer coaching, right? You don't see that a lot because at a certain point in life, like, it's just a really big ask for people to give up their time like this. And to make that person have wasted that time and gotten nothing out of the time that they generously donated, I'm never okay with. Um, yeah, and I, I don't like to see stuff like this in debate. I don't want this to be the activity that I build my career around if this is the experience that someone we've invited into our community has. Let's hear the next judge's decision. Right. Don't say sorry. You made the right call. Good job on that. Um, nope. This was a close debate. I could have saw myself voting either way either time, so good job on that. Um, there... If you see yourself voting either way at any point, then it was probably kind of messy, but it it's a very nice thing to say. It was also class generated. I ended up voting affirmative overall because I do not think that there was a substance of this debate that was preferable or an office of reason why I should reject the affirmative or why the affirmative creates a world that would be bad for debate at hand. And in order to win that theory argument, you have to prove that the affirmative does something that will make debate net bad. I am very persuaded by the affirmative's last summary that says that we are not making debate bad because evidence is something that actually in, incentivizes us to become better debaters, better researchers for us to explore the world. But also there are claims inside of every piece of evidence that we make, but also every argument that we make and claims are supported by what? Lawrence. Which means that I'm very persuaded by the affirmative reason for why the theory shell should not be preferred over substance. So not granting you that theory, that means that after, um, that means that after I grant them that you know your theory doesn't really have any impact to it. There's no reason to prefer the theory. I didn't look at the substance of the debate. 
in terms of the substance I find the approach. So I think that answer on theory is very well thought out, very substantive, and absolutely right. So was the other one. I mean, it's just that's what happens when you have messy theory debate. You make a path to victory for each person, and the judge picks which one they want to follow. Um, so yeah. It's going to be extremely persuasive. There's no offensive reason to reject the affirmative or end up voting out. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of to the point. That was kind of to my point. Um, hopefully that um, was useful. Good job to everybody in the round, right? Like just because you had a messy round doesn't mean that you're not an accomplished and great debater. It just means that you haven't turned the corner to become as good as you could be. Um, Talk about the round in the comments if you want, or ask me other questions for me to answer. That's three hours. That's three hours almost to the second. Though I'm probably going to cut out the few minutes where I was saying hi to my girlfriend. So it'll probably not seem like it was exactly three hours, but wowee, that was three hours. Um, goodbye.